Good morning, everybody. Uh, we're live and we're going to start uh, with John Huber. John? Okay, thank you all and welcome to the second Eurofuel NORA conference. Um, just as a beginning, I want to emphasize antitrust restrictions of this meeting. Um, we will only have speakers generally having conversations, so I'll go through this quickly. Um, you cannot discuss any current or future pricing. You cannot discuss what fair profits would be, how changes in prices might occur, any pricing proposals, um, no, discu no discussions of discounts and credit terms, control of sales, market allocation, or boycotts. Um, the EU has similar restrictions to US, so everybody should be con con be aware that they have those restrictions and be careful of what they say live. Um, as a moderator, I'm going to be very brief in introductions of people. Um, you can trust Maurice and I to assure that everybody who has been invited are experts in their field and will give good presentations and their full bio bios are on the website as part of the agenda. So you can review those at your leisure, but we decide not to waste time giving everybody's college, et cetera, et cetera, because everybody's overqualified for what they're doing today. Um, the other thing that I wanted to make sure is that as a welcome, we are gonna have a way to try to have people talk to each other as individuals at the end of each session, end of each day where they can talk to each other and Don has demonstrated that and sent out some videos on how to do that. So hopefully that will work. It's a new technology and hopefully it won't be a long-term technology as we start to meet in person in the future years. Um, the other thing I was going to mention is that, um, let's see, the, the final thing I do want to welcome everybody and you know I'll say that I'm glad that Maritz and I and Eurofuel have been able to establish and maintain this relationship. I think it's very important for us to do information sharing between the two continents, um, including Canada over here and all of Europe there. I think there's an expression in the United States that was developed in the Revolutionary War that we can either hang together or we can hang apart. And we've chose to try to hang together and try to solve problems whether they're technology or public policy together so that we can bring the best resources to bear on situations and work as coherently together as possible. With that, I wanna turn it over to my friend, um, Marit Spellingen. Thanks a lot, John. Uh, a warm welcome from my side as well uh, to all, everyone in Europe, the United States and in, in other regions. I'm here in Germany, Hamburg, weather is not fine, but everything okay. Welcome to our second web-based uh, conference uh, done by Nora and Eurofuel. And after the very good feedback in the last year, we decided to do this again. Another reason is that developments in environmental policy are changing quickly. I think they are accelerating sharply. And I think it is really a problem to follow everything and we need every time new ideas and new solutions that makes these conferences, I think, interesting. I very much appreciate the very good exchange in between Nora and Eurofuel. It's always very interesting to see what's going on in other countries. In Europe, we have about 20 million homes heated with domestic heating oil. I think that's, that's a lot. It's mostly in rural areas. And we always have to have in mind that this off-grid people have to find a solution when we talk about other solutions like district heating or whatever. Eurofuel, for that reason, always stands for technology-oriented solutions. The goal is, in EU, to reduce CO2 emissions from 1990 to 2030 uh, of, uh, by 55%, which is a lot, and we will achieve, we shall achieve a zero emission in 2050. Hard work to do. I will hope that we will found that we have found an inter interesting program to show new aspects how to do so. Thanks a lot.
Okay, and I'm gonna turn it over to Ed Newberry. Uh, you will note on your screen, there's an opportunity to ask comments. I will review those as the moderator for today and try to ask the speaker if there's time. We're gonna try to hold the schedule, um, you know, finish in about two and a half hours. So if there's time, I will push those questions to the speaker. We encourage speakers to go to the, when they re-register as an attendee to review any questions that might've come in that they can address with the individual if we don't have an opportunity to ask them orally. So with that, um, Ed Newberry from Squire Patton Boggs will give a presentation. John, thank you. Good morning and, and, and good morning to all of you. Maurice, thank you for, for uh, uh, your presentation as well. <clears throat> and I'm absolutely delighted to be here to be able to speak about this issue. John and I first started working together on heating oil issues in 1995. Um, and the environment in 1995 here in the United States was dramatically different than it is dramatically different it is than it is today. And the story I'm going to tell you in just a couple of minutes about the environmental policy in the United States today is dramatically different than it was just two years ago, just one year ago uh, during the Trump administration and reflects a very uh, dramatic change in, in, in the direction of the United States. Now, I should to give you a little bit about, about my perspective as I come to this. While I've represented the heating oil industry in the United States since 1995, um, the other hat I wear is, is, the, is the hat of a global managing partner of a big law firm with offices across the globe, including in Europe. Squire Patton Boggs is my firm, including in Europe and Middle East and Asia and elsewhere. And so we watch these environmental issues very closely because while uh, this is a, a, uh, a fuel, an energy source that is, it, it has a direct uh, consequence from environmental policy. What we found in our practices across the globe is that environmental policy affects every industry in, in very, very significant ways. And so we've watched it very, very carefully. You know, here in the United States, with the with the advent of the Biden administration, we saw, as I said a second ago, a very dramatic shift in U.S. environmental policy. Uh, the uh, Under the Trump administration, the U.S. left the Paris Climate Accord. Uh, under the Biden administration, the U.S. rejoined almost immediately as soon as as, as President Biden uh, came to, to office. And the reason for that is that the environmental policy of the United States now is guided by the president's belief that climate change is an existential threat. And everything that flows on environmental policy flows from that idea that President Biden views climate change as an existential threat. Now, having said that, the president although he's tended to be a little more um, uh, progressive than, than some may have thought because he's being pushed by a, a more liberal wing of his party, the president has traditionally been known as a centrist and tried to balance the interests of, of business and economy and jobs, which are important in the United States right now, given the impact of the pandemic over a long period of time, with the need to protect the environment. But one of the things we're seeing in U.S. environmental policy under the Biden administration is a shift so that those concerns, those economic concerns, those job concerns really appear to be taking a bit of a back seat to the larger concern of the president that climate change is an existential threat. And so everything that, that you see in the Biden administration flows from that. And so we see strong measures at the federal, U.S. federal government level uh, in not just environmental policy, but now at every agency in which there are environmental implications. Transportation, which is one of the largest producers of carbon, whether it be the airplanes or the buses or whatever the, the transport mission is, or agriculture or construction or the power industry, all of those federal agencies have now received a mandate from the president of the United States to be extremely active and proactive, not just active, proactive in fighting um, the, the threat of, carb, uh, of, of climate change. And in so doing, um, investing massive efforts, massive amounts of money, time and resources into developing policies and to investing resources to, to battle that, that threat. The same thing is happening on the international level. That is, at, while the U.S. domestic policy right down to individual agencies is being affected, so is U.S. international policy. U.S. diplomacy. And so rejoining the Paris Accords is one thing, but I think even perhaps more significant is naming John Kerry Special Envoy for Climate. John Kerry was the Secretary of State 
during a previous Democratic presidency, and to name a former Secretary of State as the special envoy for climate change says a lot about, about where the administration is headed. And so a lot of these issues, and I think one of the reasons this conference is so important, is a lot of these issues really do come together because instead of being just a domestic issue, the Biden administration is now looking at them as international issues. Now, one of the things, again, I, I talk about the guiding philosophy being climate change as an existential threat. One of the things to look at is the history of how the president got here. And if you look, the president's proposals when he first began running for office were widely criticized by, by the more uh, activist environmental arms in the United States as being not strong enough. And the president, while he was running in a primary process with competitors, was pushed very hard to become more aggressive and indeed did so. And so one of the things that 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 happened along the way is there were this series of Biden Sanders unity task force meetings. And that's where Bernie Sanders, the senator from Vermont, who was one of the challengers to uh, President Biden for the in the primary process for the presidency, but who is extremely liberal, particularly on environmental issues. He, together with now the president, came together with these uni unity task forces. And the Biden environmental policy largely came out of that because of all the criticism of the early policies, the president became more, more active. And so what you saw then, for example, were recommendations that came out of the, the Unity Task Force, such as zero emissions from the power sector by 2035. Now, we heard Maurice say uh, uh, zero emissions by 2050. That remains the overall U.S. goal. But 2035 for the power sector, very, very hard, very, if 2050 is hard, 2035 by the, uh, by the power sector uh, to, to zero emissions is, is extremely hard. And the only way to do that is very significant uh, regulatory and and policy changes along the way. You see the same thing in transportation, where the president pledged that any city with a population of more than 100,000 people, and there are a lot of cities in the United States with more than 100,000 people, 100,000 people will have access to low cost, low carbon transportation. That's a big, big undertaking. Agriculture, which is a big contributor to these issues, dramatic changes in agriculture, constructions, Green building now becomes a, a very, and this affects your industry, green buildings now become a priority across not just the federal sector, but across, across the nation. And then the other thing you see is the president's $2.3 trillion in the United States, $2.3 trillion infrastructure bill is heavily, heavily focused uh, with, with initiatives that are designed to address um, environmental issues, whether it be electric vehicles or electric vehicle charging or alternative sources or renewable sources of energy or any of those, any of those kinds of things are chock-a-block full in that bill and the president is, is committed to that. And uh, carbon neutrality by 2050. 2050 is not very long from now. 19 years from today, uh, 19, 29 years from today. It's not that long from now until carbon neutrality. We have a long, long way to go. Now, if you want to see how this has played out in the administration, you can look at specific things that the president has done. He's only been in office now for just over four months, just about four months. And on the first day, he canceled the Keystone Pipeline. Now, the Keystone Pipeline was, uh, 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 for many people, a, a critical producer of jobs, but more importantly, for many people, a critical uh, element in uh, national security, energy security, and he canceled that. Interesting that there's some discussion now in the United States because you may have read, those of you in Europe and those of you on the East Coast felt it, the closing through a cyber attack of the colonial pipeline in the United States really gave rise to some severe concerns, serious concerns about energy security. But the first day killed the, the Keystone pipeline. Um, second, every agency uh, has been directed to take uh, action to promote climate friendly, climate change addressing regulations and policies. Every agency, particularly the EPA, because most of these agencies, uh, most of these regulations were in the EPA, EPA in particular has been directed to look at more than 100, about 110 Trump era regulations 
that eased environmental restrictions in some way. In some cases, eliminated them. In other cases, eased them. In other cases, uh, just changed the framework in, in, in ways that the environmental community did not think was environmentally friendly. It's 110 regulations. That is an enormous number of regulations. And so one of the questions that will play out here in the United States is what happens uh, in that review? Do they go back to the old policy? Maybe that's what happened. The Trump, what will, will happen in some cases, the Trump administration relaxation or elimination of a rule will go simply go back to what the rule was in the past. But there's a lot of thought that that's not in the environmental community, that that's not far enough. And that what needs to happen is that the entire structure of whatever the issue is in the 110 rules needs to be relooked. And, and going back to where we were wasn't enough. We need to go in the, in the, in the, the minds of the environmentalists further and, and make the rules more restrictive because of all these commitments to, uh, uh, to carbon reduction, emissions reductions, and because of the view that climate change is an existential threat. What that means for this industry in the United States is at the federal level, there could be actions and it'll trickle down to the state level that are going to be serious actions that are going to have real impacts on this industry going forward. Now, I will say, John, uh, you and, and your colleagues in Europe have been extremely proactive in coming up with uh, more environmentally friendly uh, fuel mixes, more environmentally friendly policies, more environmentally friendly technology, and those things make a huge difference. But I think the reality is that review of all those issues, that view of the administration on the question of, of environmental policy is going to lead to pretty significant uh, pressure on this particular industry. Uh, you're going to see it in various ways. One is a doubling you're seeing it now, and the doubling of the amount of money that's being proposed by the administration for renewable fuels, renewable sources of energy, wind turbines or solar or others, pressure to move away from fossil fuels and move towards renewable energies. Second, an end, and the president called for this immediately, an end to all fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, an end to all fossil fuel subsidies changes the economics of fossil fuels as the economics of fossil fuels trickles down through uh, throughout the various industries and distribution sources that will have an impact on the industry. I mentioned previously the power sector being fossil fuel free by 2035. Fossil fuel free by 2035. That, again, that's not very far 14 years from now. There's also kind of an, a, a very interesting um, uh, change in the in the in the regulations uh, in, in the regulatory approach that's embodied in something called the social carbon cost, and the social carbon cost is essentially um, evaluating that when you're evaluating a rule or a regulation or a policy, you take into account the cost of the climate change impacts that can be avoided by that rule or regulation, meaning it makes that rule or regulation, even though it may appear restrictive to business, more attractive uh, financially because of its impact on climate change. And right now, uh, the social carbon cost was just raised by the Biden administration to $51 per ton. Um, and that has a significant impact on policymaking. So you see all those kinds of things. And I think what that means for this industry is, is continued pressure continued pressure in, in, in ways uh, that are competitive comp from competitors who, who will allege that they are cleaner fuels or better fuels or, or more environmentally friendly fuels, but you're also going to see it from the regulatory pinch, you might call it, the regulatory pinch that you're going to feel as all of this uh, trickles through the industry. The last, last point I'd make, and it, it's, it's one that ties um, this conference back to um, uh, you know, the overall domestic policy of the United States is the focus of the United States on using its diplomatic channels to achieve its climate change goals. And again, I referenced John Kerry, the former Secretary of State, as the special envoy. Um, you, see, you see the U.S. rejoining the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, all of those things, the, the, the injection of environmental issues into American diplomacy will also have an impact on this industry in the United States, but also in Europe. And I do think the notion of the collaboration and cooperation that you have going on today um, is, is, is absolutely critical to 
uh, addressing that threat, which is really a threat to, to, to the industry over time, addressing that threat in a, in a meaningful way. The last set of comments I'll make is this. While we talk about federal policy, um, in the United States, heating oil is not regulated. It's regulated in the ways I just discussed indirectly, but it's not regulated directly by the federal government. But in the various states, and I know many of you are feeling this, in the various states, um, there are uh, a lot of regulatory schemes. There's rules and policies and rulemaking where elected officials, uh, even at the, at the highest levels of state government, which in the United States are the governors, seeking to directly impact the heating oil industry. And that is going to increase uh, significantly as the Biden administration moves environmental policy in the direction I just described. That'll particularly in increase in states in which there's a Democratic governor or a Democratic attorney general, because the attorney generals have a lot of power uh, in the states, or both. But you're going to see that continue to grow and move the debate in a, in a way where environmental issues, carbon issues, emission issues become more and more central in the states, and the states will become more and more specifically active in the heating oil business in the United States. And that is actually, in my view, a greater threat uh, than, than even the federal regulation and the federal policies, because they're less direct in the states, they're more direct. And so, John, let me stop there. Uh, this is about 15 minutes, I think, and I promised I'd try not to go over. I think I probably did. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm happy to stay on the line. And I just want to, again, congratulate you for this terrific conference. I think it's a great idea. The collaboration across the Atlantic uh, between Europe and the United States on, on a, a whole a range of issues. I, I serve as a member of the board of the Atlantic Council here in the United States, the Atlantic Council, which bridges the policy gaps between Europe and, and the United States. I think this is a really important initiative, and uh, uh, I'm really delighted you're doing it. So thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. And again, thank you so much for having me this morning. Okay. And the only question I saw was from Dave Sousa, which is very technical about water use, which I don't think that you're prepped to answer. But we'll try to get back to you on that, Dave, later. Um, Thank you much, Ed, for that demoralizing presentation for the industry, but it just shows I, the challenge I, ahead. Yes. Can I just can I just interject something? I should have said this if I have one minute. In the United States, we're in a very unstable political environment, and there is a very high probability in the United States that the U.S. House or the U.S. Senate or both the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate switched from Democratic control, which they have now, to Republican control. That will, and that's 18 months till the election, that will, if that happens, put a break on environmental, the shift in environmental policy. It won't stop it. It'll put a break on it. But things change as they just did between last year and this year, and they could very well change in the near term and in the longer term as well. So it's not quite as demoralizing as it may sound, um, but, it, but, but right now it's a bit demoralizing. John, you're right. Thank you, Ed, very much. Appreciate Thank your you. time. Um, our next speaker is Barbara Corman with Hanover, who will give us an update on the European view. So Barbara, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, John. And uh, thank you to the organizers, both Eurofuel and Nora, to, uh, to have me here today. And thanks, Ed, as well, for this, uh, well, very interesting insight into what's happening in, uh, in the US. And I would say, I mean, personally, I'm pretty happy, I would say, that the U.S. is taking a different, more environmental-friendly approach. But of course, that comes with a great deal of challenges, as, as you've rightly so uh, outlined. So uh, I will give an overview of developments in the EU. I would say we're probably a little bit ahead of the game uh, than what's going on in the U.S., but also here uh, a wide set of yeah, challenges, I would say. So maybe if we could go to the, to the next slide. Yeah, perfect. <clears throat> so that comes from probably everybody here has heard about the European Green Deal. So the European Green Deal in 2019, the EU decided that they wanted to be the first climate neutral continent. And if the US remains on the current ambitions of the president, will not be the only one. Um, but so in order to reach carbon neutrality by 2050, there's a whole range of actions that need to be taken. And there's some here on the slide, if you can see them, but it ranges from biodiversity to circular economy, uh, but of course also an overhaul of all the climate and energy legislation in order to reach that target. Now, this Green Deal is not just about environmental initiatives. It's very much also a green growth strategy. 
So there's also a lot of sort of initiatives to push industry, uh, to incentivize industry into clean technologies um, and a just transition fund. So financing mechanism to support that transition in order to leave no one behind. Um, uh, wait, there's one second. Do you want to delete the background slide? I think it's fine as it is. Thank you. Sorry. Um, Sorry, I was uh, confused for a second. But so yeah, there's there's this green growth strategy. So it's not only environmental, it's also how to support the industry uh, to get there, how to support those regions that will be most impacted uh, to get there. And uh, so the carbon neutrality target is by 2050. In the meantime, the commission has also set a target for 2030. So there should be 55% emission reductions compared to 90, 1990 levels by 2030 and the parliament and the member states have actually adopted this i think it was last week into into a law the current legal framework uh, would i mean the impact assessment shows that with the current legal framework europe would get to a 60 percent reduction by 2050 so you see that the ambitions has really have really increased uh, substantially so maybe if we go to the next slide the commission has worked on this fit for 55 package and so that's not 55 was in the year 2055 but it's really the 55 percent and uh, by this summer they will come with a revision of a number of policies that we have already in place but to upgrade those um, to be in line with this 55 percent target for 2030 and i've put some in a big a bigger font and those are the ones that are most relevant for you but there's also a number of others that we won't discuss today but that are quite relevant specifically for the transport sector so mobility but also more focused on on gas um yeah let's go to the next slide uh, this is just a timeline to show you that uh, as i said there will be a lot of revisions coming up uh, this summer basically 14th of july is a key date where you see that five of these uh, legislative pieces will be reviewed so the commission will put a proposal on the table then there's one coming up in uh, Q4 and uh, maybe also one other note on this slide is that just to show you that in addition to these European policies, we also have the national plan. So both the national member states, they have worked on their energy and climate plans where they set out what national measures they will take in order to reach the EU objectives. But they've also worked now with the COVID pandemic on recovery plans where they also have to outline okay what activities will we take to support industry to support this green uh, transition uh, yeah next slide please so what i'll do is very briefly talk you through the the main pieces of legislation that are of importance to your to your industry and uh, if any questions of course i'm happy to answer those later on so one of the probably most important ones is the renewable energy directive so what does this do the eu uh, sets a target for the share of renewables in the total energy mix. And the current target is a 32% share of renewables by 2030. Now, of course, the EU wants to uh, increase this number. And the purpose is really to limit the use of fossil fuels uh, in a number of sectors, mostly uh, heating and uh, mobility, and to promote the use of renewables. Now, what is important that is in order to increase the share for renewables and heating, um, it's important that the Commission looks at the emission reduction potential of all type of fuels and not choose specific technologies only. And also that there is a clear allocation across sectors because the current Renewable Energy Directive focuses very much on transport. And uh, I mean, the debate on biofuels, but also hydrogen, etc. I mean, is very much alive. But the question is, okay, how much uh, scale is there? How much uh, volume is there and where uh, should this be used and so I think it's important to really make the case that also for heating there's a clear need to have these um, low carbon fuels um, yeah instead of instead of the current heating oil that is that is being used so I think that's the main point on the renewable energy directive um, yeah next slide please another one that previously wasn't very relevant for your sector, but now can become very relevant, is the European Emission Trading Scheme. So I think everybody is aware this is a cap and trade system uh, for certain industries, so the energy intensive industries, where basically every, every organization gets a number of CO2 allowances and there's a cap, and every year this cap is reduced. And so that there's a price, basically it's all about putting a price on carbon. And by reducing the cap, the allowances that are on the market become 
that become fewer and therefore more expensive. And if you do better than the number of allowances you have, you can sell your allowances. If you do worse, basically you can buy allowances on the market. Now, uh, the idea is now that the commission is thinking of expanding the scope. So not just for energy intensive industries and electricity generation, but also potentially to include buildings and transport um, into the ETS. The idea behind that is that it would create revenue for governments. So if governments can auction these allowances, they get new revenue and that revenue they can then use to help lower income people, uh, households or SMEs um, to make the transition to cleaner energy. However, there's of course a lot of criticism. How would this work? Uh, can you just put a price, a European price on carbon? What would be the impact on especially lower income people? Um, what would also be uh, the administrative burden that comes with that? So there's there's a lot of things that need to be reviewed very carefully. Uh, also with the existing architecture that is in the member states, you know, because member states can have their specific policies based on the national circumstances. What is the climate situation? How many off-grid uh, rural areas do you have? Um, what is the availability of renewable energy sources? I mean, there's a lot of elements that come into play um, and where we have the national frameworks that can, can offer support. So the question is, how will, how will these coexist uh, or be replaced if the ETS will be uh, extended to, to heating as well? So there, yeah, it's important to be coherent, to have policy coherence, but we'll have to see uh, how, that, how that plays out. Next slide, please very much linked to the uh, ETS, so the European Emission Trading Scheme, is this uh, effort sharing regulation. So basically that is for all the sectors that are not covered under the ETS. They are basically covered by this effort sharing regulation. And the big difference is that this does not put a price on carbon. This is sort of an effort for regulatory uh, development. So every member state is, uh, has received a target uh, a an emission reduction target and so they need to take the appropriate measures at national level in order to, to, to do their share and that target is very much based on the economic circumstances of each member state so for instance Bulgaria actually has a target of zero whereas Sweden or Luxembourg have the highest uh, targets they need to ensure a, a reduction of 40% so this, I mean, the impact of the revision of the effort sharing regulation will very much depend on what the Commission will do with the emission trading scheme. So will, will this be phased out if heating would be included um, in the emission trading scheme or will the two coexist? Will there be parallel systems? Um, yeah, the impact would need to be, would need to be uh, seen still. What is important here is that there is this EU recovery budget so as I mentioned before, there is within the Green Deal, there is a just transition fund that is 7.5 billion that the EU has set aside to support uh, the transi transition in certain regions that are most heavily impacted. But there is also, since the pandemic, a uh, recovery fund, and that is 750 billion uh, euros, where every member state is drafting a plan where they have to set aside at least 37% of, of the funding to go into uh, the clean transition. So there it's important to, to use that budget and, and, and to allocate it um, also to support your sector. So to really be the driver for, for transformation um, in heating, among others. Next slide, please. So then we have the energy efficiency directive. So there the purpose is really to um, reduce overall energy consumption or to increase, to become more energy efficient. And uh, there, it's not as much a question of increasing the target to become more energy efficient, but just making sure that uh, that that it becomes a more efficient piece of legislation, let's say. And it could be through a series of non-regulatory measures, more training, more awareness, more information campaigns. Um, but it could also be through, okay, how, how are we actually going to make sure that buildings, for instance, become more energy efficient, that there is recovery of waste, heat, uh, that we do more renovation. So it's linked also to a number of other initiatives, such as the renovation wave and also uh, the next slide, and I'll come to that in a second, the energy performance of buildings. But what is important here is that it's important that the Commission keeps a holistic view while looking at energy efficiency, because of course you can be more energy efficient in the end use consumption, for instance, but actually by uh, 
the development of new technologies such as like uh, energy generation through through hydrogen electrolysis can actually take up more or use more energy so it's it's important there to 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 take a balance that overall the entire value chain let's say becomes uh, becomes more energy efficient and it's important also that uh, member states can maintain flexibility on how to achieve the savings so that it's not necessarily putting targets on each step of the value chain but rather to look at this um, from a from an overall perspective next slide please so this is what I said, very much linked to the Energy Efficiency Directive. The energy performance of buildings will also be reviewed. And there, the Commission will really look at specifically yeah, the energy use and the renovation of, um, of buildings. And actually, at the moment, buildings are responsible for approximately 40% of EU energy consumption. So that's, that's quite a lot. It's the single largest uh, energy consumer in Europe. And about 75% of the buildings currently are are not very energy efficient and only one percent of those is being renovated as we speak per year so so the commission really wants to uh, encourage renovation there is also an initiative called the renovation wave where they say that they want to double uh, the annual energy renovation rate of buildings by 2030 and really foster this deep renovation so in this specific uh, directive, the Commission is looking at minimum energy performance standards for buildings, um, including residential, so not only public buildings, and uh, strengthening certain tools on how you can uh, measure the energy performance, energy performance certificates, uh, but also creating appropriate financing mechanisms. So this one will come towards the end of the year after the energy efficiency target uh, has been set. Next slide, please. Uh, no, one back. Yeah, that one. So that is the last one on, on my list. So there is also the Energy Taxation Directive. So that is a directive that sets rules uh, for the taxation of energy products, uh, among which heating fuel. And the purpose is really that the, the Commission wants to remove all the fossil fuel subsidies, which are mostly given in transport, but also to make sure that the current system, which is quite outdated because it's it dates from 2003, and there was a previous attempt to revise it, but that failed because, uh, yeah, they couldn't they couldn't come to an agreement, the member states and the parliament. But so now the commission wants to revise this and to make sure that any taxation given on energy products sends the right uh, price signal to consumers and, and also provides the incentives to producers, um, yeah, to, to produce fuels that have, or energy products that have a lower uh, footprint. So, yeah, here it's important as well that the Commission will differentiate across sectors, that there will be incentives given for clean solutions, and of course that the price impact, um, that, that the Commission really looks at the price impact on, on who will actually be paying, be paying that. Because of course the impact on households can be quite, can be quite large, uh, especially due to the inelasticity of demand uh, for heating fuel. So yeah, that will be reviewed in July as well. And that brings me sort of to my last slide and some comments, let's say some reflections. So I would say overall, there's, there's a lot of practical challenges. I mean, we've seen there's a number of files uh, on the table and the commission has a lot of work to be done. So I would say there's a lot of revisions at the same time, which makes it complex to keep this policy coherent uh, and to make sure that people still have the full overview. So the, the coherence and the synergies are important, and I think it's the task of the industry as well to make sure that policymakers understand how the different things link together. And if an incentive is given in one, that this is not being undone, let's say, in another piece of legislation. Uh, important in that regard is also the consideration of national circumstances. Uh, I think especially in Europe, uh, through Europe fuel, I mean, already, the industry is already very active through a number of national associations. Um, but I think that that's really important to engage with the member states, um, with the members of parliament that come from specific regions and that really understand uh, the concerns. Because you cannot compare a country like Sweden with Poland, with Italy, let's say. Institutional uh, impact is important because, of course, the whole deal is about, well, leaving no one behind. It should be a just transition, it should be an inclusive transition, but of course, the impact is different on, on, on certain groups and we've all seen with uh, the yellow vest movement uh, that there is i mean the pandemic has sort of put that a bit uh, to the background but of course there is a strong movement people saying well 
all good and well that climate is important and that we want to go to this clean transition, but who's actually going to pay it, right? At the end of the month, um, people feel it in their wallets. And then the last point is maybe the policy mix. I mean, what is the right policy mix? One could say, okay, we don't want to put a price on carbon for heating, for instance, but then on the other hand, what will do the trick? Because it's clear that the ambition is, is massive, and in order to reach it, everybody will have to contribute. But the question is, of course, how can we, yeah, how can we make sure that the incentives that are there are being used for industries like yours to make sure that the potential that is there uh, for low carbon fuels, etc., can really be used to the fullest. So uh, that's it. Happy to take any questions. Otherwise, this is a very fruitful discussions uh, today and. and Barbara, thank you very much. You covered quite a bit of ground quite thoroughly, and I think it's very eye-opening for us in the United States of how many branches and how many avenues are being undertaken simultaneously. And I think that's what Ed was alluding to, a lot of different things, moving along simultaneous tracks, different policy approaches. So similar approach, as I've said, whenever we visit with Europe, it's always like looking into the future a bit, which is always appreciated. So thank you very much. And I'll turn this now to Paul um, Rose with Offtech, who's also a good friend, and he'll give us an update on what's going on in the UK or Great Britain or whatever branch they're covering at this point after dropping out of the EU. Paul? Hi, thank, thanks, John. And uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. There is an awful lot going on. Um, so welcome, everybody. Um, thanks, John. Thanks, Moritz, for giving me the opportunity to give you guys a flavor of what is going on in the UK at the moment. What does decarbonization look like? What has there been any impact from Brexit? So if we can just launch into the, the first slide. Um, so, well, sorry, the next slide. Yeah, so just is a blatant plug, just to give you an idea of what Ofttech actually is. So we're we were incorporated as the Oil, Fire and Technical Association. So we, we are a trade association that looks, looks after the interests of heating equipment manufacturers across both the UK and the Republic of Ireland. We work closely with um, a number of training centers that offer training and competency assessment um, in heat. And many technicians that go through those centers will ultimately register with us for um, their chosen technologies and we're currently offering um, oil solid fuel biomass uh, solar heat pumps all the all non-gas heating technologies um, so we've currently got about 10,000 registered technicians with us that operate across 7,000 businesses so we we kind of think we know what we're talking about and we obviously liaise with government in terms of uh, policy development. Uh, if we go to the next slide, this really just gives a few numbers, gives you an idea of what the heating market looks like in the UK and Ireland. So we're about one and a half million homes on kerosene for the UK and a further 680,000 in the Republic of Ireland. And we burn through about 3 million tonnes of, uh, of kerosene annually. Um, good combination of um, older appliances. We've been on condensing technology since 2006. And obviously, we're now into the blue flame and low knock stuff along with the uh, ERP and those kind of things. And that has, that has remained unchanged since Brexit. But if we can just go to the next slide, just a point of interest. We, the UK and Ireland are very different markets um, in as much that in Great Britain, uh, we've got 24 million homes that are on mains gas and one and a half million that are on oil, uh, mostly in a rural setting, so off the, off the gas grid. Um, in Ireland, it's very different um, because of an underdeveloped gas grid, then 50% of homes are reliant upon and alternative heating solution to gas. So the relevance of that in the decarbonisation discussion is that Ireland are in a much stronger place to be listened to um, when government are exploring solutions, um, you know, for future heat policy. I mean, it goes without saying that electric solutions are very much 
the front runner in terms of government policy across across both regions. So if we just go on to the next slide, I mean, it is really the agenda, what I'm here to talk about this afternoon. Um, hopefully I'll get it in inside my allocated slot. So if we go straight into um, the next slide, uh, national heat strategy. So what has happened since Brexit? Well, I can assure you that in terms of climate commitment, we still remain very committed to domestic and international efforts. Um, in 2019, via our own Climate Change Act, we moved the ambition from 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 1990 levels to achieving net zero by 2050. So Brexit hasn't derailed that ambition at all. Um, if we go to the next slide, despite the fact we are a tiny little island, um, we, we are somewhat complicated in that we've chosen to devolve heat. So although the UK has got a legally binding target overall, we have left heat policy to the devolved nations. So England are currently consulting um, on options um, to do our houses. Well, Wales are looking at their own building regulations and ambitions. Originally, they were aligned to England, but they are now making um, lots of uh, sort of hints that they want to go to net zero much zo sooner and they are currently consulting on what, what options. Um, I mean, allowing the devolved nations to do their own thing um, does have a positive in that it can take into account the local um, infrastructure, the, the different housing types and the local economy. So it kind of does make sense as long as everything contributes to the end goal. Scotland are doing something slightly different. I mean, they've got 129,000 oil homes in Scotland. They are on an ambition to go net zero by 2045 with an interim target of a 75% reduction in emissions by 2030 across their society. So very high ambitions. Um, what is slightly odd is that the way they're accounting for emissions. So they've chosen to go for low regrets, uh, what they're calling zero carbon technologies at the point of use. So they're actually decided not to consider the fact that heat pumps are driven by electricity, which in itself is derived by 50% gas turbine. So whilst that, you know, this approach may favour accounting processes, I think there's very high risk in Scotland that once consumers get the um, idea that they're not as carbon zero as they, they were, thought they were, this has got very high potential to derail support for decarbonisation in Scotland. And we've got ongoing discussions and dialogue with the policy developers uh, in that region. So if we go on to the next slide, there are some common threads. Um, so this is basically the hierarchy across all regions. Um, so at the top of the triangle there, um, dealing with new build, only building buildings that are very low heat demand, um, near carbon zero solutions. And why wouldn't you? If you've got a clean sheet, sheet of paper, why would you build a house that, that takes fossil fuels going forward? Energy efficiency measures are going to de be deployed right the way across the housing stock as well as commercial buildings. The green slug that you see in the middle, that, sorry, the brown slug that you see in the middle there is the off gas grid building. So these are predominantly our customers that burn coal, coal oil, um, LPG, or they're using one-to-one -one electricity. So considered the most carbon intensive homes in the nation. The government has, has already published a clean, clean growth strategy and it's it's stated that the government's ambition is to treat these homes during the 2020s. So within the next decade, it's seen that these are homes is to be, well, to use the terms that have been used, um, a testing ground, or let's learn by doing 
and, and using these homes to build supply chains, test skills in the marketplace. Um, not necessarily fair, but that's, uh, that's what's going on. Because the on-grid buildings, which is the biggest slug, 24 million homes on gas grid, the future is kind of uncertain because it's such a big nut to crack. But it's likely that the natural gas will be replaced with biogas or possibly hydrogen going forward. If we can go to the next slide, this just gives um, a summary of our Prime Minister's uh, published ambition uh, a couple of months ago when his 10 point plan was billed as the Green Industrial Revolution. And it kind of all makes sense. It all hangs together, advancing offshore wind and low carbon technologies, decarbonizing transport. Um, it's the direction that all nations should be going in. Um, but at the end of the day, for that to be delivered, you have to have effective policies. And we are still waiting um, on announcements. What, what Boris did say is that he hopes that there'll be 600,000 heat pumps being installed annually in the UK by 2028. Um, we're currently um, installing about 30,000 heat pumps a year at the moment. So that is a massive ramp up in a very short period of time um, to deploy that amount of heat pumps going forward. Okay, if we can go on to the next slide. Um, a little bit closer to home, the real world challenges, as I would call them. I mean, consumers in the UK really don't know what's coming. They, the cost and the magnitude of change on consumers is immense um, in, in all, all their lifestyle. Uh, and, and heat is just a very small part of it. Um, but it can be disruptive. I mean, the, the cost of loans, the off-grid housing stock in England is not what you would call energy efficient. It's um, a few of the later houses are, but you're, you've got houses that are going back almost a century. And the estimations for some of these um, older homes is somewhere between 10 and 18,000 pounds to be spent on fabric improvements before you can actually fit a heat pump, which would be cost you in a between seven and 14,000 pounds. So massive investment there. And unlike the 60s, when we came away from solid fuel in favor of um, automatic gas and oil boilers, there was an immediate payback. It was convenient, it was controllable. So people's lives improved and therefore that change was accepted. I'm not sure we can say the same for um, a transition to, to low carbon, although it it still, still needs to be done. And then who will pay for it all? Um, there's, you know, th this is going to cost billions. And we must remember that we're just, as a, globally, we are just coming out of a, a COVID pandemic and economies are going to take many, many years to recover from vaccination programs and other intervention me measures to keep the economies going. And above all, this transition needs to be fair. So again, like every nation, there is a massive divide between those that are able to pay for renewable technologies and upgrades to their buildings. And there are also those that are in the, in the camp where they are reliant wholly upon assistance from others. Um, we believe that choice is, is paramount in dealing with this um, and and gifting an entire market to one or two technologies um, is not going to create competition. It's not going to create innov innovation in the marketplace, which both would serve to drive prices down and, and gain buy-in from consumers. So if we go to the next slide, that's just a summary of what our proposals are. We need to stop talking about decarbonisation and actually get on with it. We've got product now um, that can be sold. We are, we are trialing HVO um, to displace kerosene with very good results. Um, and we, we would think that we would retain about a million homes. So two thirds of the current market, um, we would retain on liquid fuels. If the government were to mandate next year using the current churn 
um, of replacement boilers, um, plus a few early adopters, we think we can churn the entire oil boiler market onto HVO in the next 15 years. And all we really need to do that is a clear signal from government, preferably a financial support to accelerate the market and give confidence to the fuel suppliers and manufacturers that there is a market to sell into. And on the next slide, just to il illustrate um, the power of choice. So this, this is a pathway that was developed to show what can be achieved. So this takes one and a half million homes. The yellow bars indicate the carbon reductions that would be achieved if you was to churn um, 100,000 boilers per year onto electric solutions your carbon would reduce by these, um, the length of these yellow bars going down to 2037. Using HVO as a solution, then you would, you would cover the green bars. The brown ones represent a combination of 80% heat pumps with 20% biomass, which would be used for the hardest to treat homes where the infrastructure or the heat demand was just so big that heat pump would not perform or could cater for that. What we believe going forward is where the yet where the purple bar sits is probably where the realistic pathway lies, where we lose uh, thirty five percent of our market to heat pumps because that is financially viable to transition those. And the remaining 65% remains on a HBO liquid fuel solution. So what you can see from this chart um, is that the advantage of HVO in these early years, because it's here today and it can be used, you're getting deeper cuts in carbon than a heat pump solution can deliver because of the carbon intensity of the, of the power generation. But as you tail out then towards 2037, then you see that all solutions are the, the Essel's heat pump biomass pretty much plays out given an equal degree of uh, carbon reduction measures. But we look at this in terms of risk, where HBO is here today, and yes, there are questions around cost and feedstock and availability. Um, on, on, I think that's more for markets to decide and not governments. And uh, so in terms of risk, if there is any deviation in the government's figures and pathway to decarbonize grid electricity because of electricity demand increases with, with heat, with the deployment of electric vehicles, with population growth, um, then the heat pump solution stands to still be very carbon intensity, intensive in 15 years time, whereas HVO is pretty much certain to deliver on target. So if we can just go to the next slide, I mean, that's really where the oil industry is. I'm just conscious of time. Um, if we, I'll just give you a flavor of COP26. If we um, just skip over, go to the next slide. Okay, and the next one. So this, there's five reasons really why this is uh, important. Um, so nearly 200 nations are invited to attend COP uh, between the 1st and the 12th of November in Scotland, hosted by the UK and Italy. There's clearly going to be lots of decisions to be taken. Probably more indecision is going to be taken, um, politicians being what they are. But the outcomes of this directly impacts the governments um, and, and in turn, um, manufacturers of equipment because they obviously need certainty for investment and innovation. So it's six years since Paris was adopted and really this is the first opportunity to see how effective it is. Um, the nation's ambition is going to be the, the top priorities. Um, on this and it's going to be interesting to see what the US brings to the table um, now we're, we're in the Biden administration. So the second reason, if we can just go to the next yeah. slide. Um, hey, just hey, Paul, we need to wrap up pretty quickly here. We're a little bit behind now. Thank you. Yeah, okay, sorry, John. Um, yeah, I mean, 
what can I say? Well, I suppose the, the main thing here to consider is 2020 was the warmest year on record and it tied with 2016. It is quite clear that action needs to be taken. Um, on this, this graph here that was came out of the UN Environment Programme Emissions Gap Report, it's clear that we're on this trajectory for emissions to only keep increasing. They're a million miles away from where they need to be um, for two degrees or 1.5 degrees below by 2021. Um, pledges I've spoken about. Um, finance is going to be the, another another big topic. I mean, how will these developed nations raise the hundred billion dollar pledge that they're supposed to come up with? Um, the funding hasn't been delivered in the past um, and a third of the nations that are involved in Paris have actually, they are wholly reliant upon um, subsidy from the developed nations. So there is an awful lot to, um, to discuss at COP. Um, also rules around mechanisms um, for carbon trading, which was, which was touched on. Um, from the previous speaker. So we wait and see. Uh, it's a bit crystal ball predicting how COP will go. Um, the discussions continue. The only thing I would say is that the there needs to be higher ambition. Um, what is being pledged at the moment in terms of carbon reductions is nowhere near where it needs to be. Um, John, I think I better wrap it up there. Okay. Thank you, Paul. That was really good, very informative, and covered a lot of ground. Our next speaker is um, is a moderator, Cecile Norigat, and she's going to have a panel that I think is going to go a little bit deeper into the forest on what types of policies are actually going on in the different communities, as opposed to, I'll say, in the U.S., going from 30,000 feet down to just jumping right into the forest. So, Cecile, thank you very much. Thank you, John, for this uh, introduction. And uh, hello, hello, everyone. Um, I would like to uh, wish welcome, a warm welcome to all the participants to this uh, interesting session today. Um, now we are going to talk about um, the transition to renewable liquid heating fuels. My name is Cécile Noriga. I am Secretary General of UPAY. UPE is a European association based in Brussels, representing independent fuel suppliers. Um, and I will be the moderator for the following panel discussion. So as you have heard um, during the previous presentation, obviously climate policies and regulation are a key driver for the transition to renewable fuels in the heating sector. Uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, really, as we have heard. Now, this uh, panel discussion will focus a little bit more on incentives and regulatory measures to drive the deployment of renewable fuels um, and uh, assess their effectiveness. Um, so we are going to talk about greenhouse gas emission reduction standards, but also blending mandate, carbon tax, emission trading system, and also, um, what will be interesting is to talk about uh, communications to consumer and what we can do to get consumer on board, as well as um, voluntary initiatives that the industry is taking. So to discuss all these uh, important issues, we, uh, we will have three experts uh, for the session, the panel discussion today. We will have Floyd uh, Vergana, uh, Sandrine DeVos and Christian Halper. Um, and these experts have kindly accepted to join this panel discussion in order to provide us with, um, with their perspective and also to share some concrete example uh, from both the US and uh, Europe. Uh, but before we go into the panel discussion, I would just like to uh, uh, to call upon the audience uh, to please uh, share any question or any comment that you may have through the chat um, and uh, at any time really during the session. And I will uh, uh, make sure that I address most of the question as least as much as possible. 
So regarding our panel discussion, first of all, I would like to introduce uh, Floyd Vergara. Thank you, Floyd, for uh, being with us. Floyd uh, serves as um, the Director of State Governmental Affairs for the National Biodiesel Board in the United States. He has a long experience in the field, uh, including within the California Air Resources Board. Uh, thank you, Floyd, um, for being with us. And in order to get started with the discussion, I would like to ask you one uh, simple question. So, what's going on in the US? How does the US low carbon fuel standard work? And how effective it is in your, in your view? Thank you, Floyd. Uh, thank you, Cecile. Uh, I'm very happy to be here uh, on behalf of the National Biodiesel Board. Um, so just to clarify your question, uh, there is no low carbon fuel standard at the federal level, uh, at least not yet. There are two established uh, subnational programs in California and Oregon. One was just signed into law in Washington state, uh, therefore completing the world's largest uh, market for low carbon fuels uh, in, on the Pacific West Coast. So as this type of program is implemented, currently implemented it is a sector specific carbon pricing program uh, that's applied to transportation fuels. Um, I'm going to limit my uh, comments specifically to California, but they also apply to Oregon for the most part. So virtually all transportation fuels uh, used in California are covered by this program. Uh, some of the design objectives include, of course, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but secondary objectives, which are also uh, very important, in include improving local and statewide air quality, uh, reducing the state's petroleum dependency, uh, transforming the fuel pool, uh, you know, increasing diversification and consumer choices, uh, growing in-state al alternative fuels industry, and then supporting other state policy drivers such as carbon neutrality. Um, this is a closed universe type program, so uh, to ensure the trans transformation of the fuel pool. So only transportation fuels are involved. Uh, no credits can go in and out of the program uh, uh, to or from uh, non-transportation sources. The players involved include deficit holders, which are generally the petroleum refineries, and then uh, credit generators, which are generally the alternative fuel providers. There are three main uh, methods for compliance. One is through a direct reduction of the carbon content in fuels. Uh, that's through process uh, efficiency improvements, reducing decarbonizing uh, the process energy and so forth. The second method is through blending or replacing uh, components uh, in the petroleum fuel with lower carbon uh, alternative fuel analogs. And then finally, the third method is purchasing credits from uh, credit generators. The carbon content is expressed in terms of carbon intensity, uh, uh, grams of CO2 equivalent per megajoule. Uh, that's based on a peer-reviewed carbon accounting tool that was developed by the Argonne National Lab. Um, and the regulator in California's case, uh, the California Air Resources Board, uh, establishes an annual schedule of carbon intensity standards for gasoline and diesel and their substitutes. Uh, these standards are calculated to achieve uh, in the aggregate the percent carbon intensity uh, targets that the regulators are seeking. In California's case, that's a 10% CI reduction by, 20 to, by 2022, 20% uh, 20 by 2030, both of those relative to a 2010 baseline. In Oregon, it's a 10% reduction by 2025, and they're working on further reductions beyond that year. The program that was just established in Washington calls for a 10% reduction by 2031 and a 20% reduction by 2038. Uh, each of the credits in the program is equal to a metric ton of carbon reduction. Um, basically, the, the, the way the program works is you have a, an annual declining schedule of uh, carbon intensity targets. Um, the fuel providers, they tally up their credits and their deficits at the end of the year. Uh, if the credits are above, uh, gr greater than or equal to the deficits, you're in compliance. If you're below uh, the deficits, uh, then you're uh, in non-compliance and you have a, a prescribed amount of time to uh, make up that shortfall. You can purchase uh, credits in the following quarter. Um, uh, either through the open market or through a credit clearance mechanism. 
Um, and then to sum it up, the LCFS uh, in California and Oregon has succeeded expectations. Uh, CARB has reported 100% compliance for essentially all regulated parties in every year the program has uh, been in place. Uh, at this point, there are 8.1 million uh, credits remaining in the bank, which are available for the owners to draw down uh, for compliance purposes or to sell to other regulated parties as the standards continue to ratchet down. So uh, that's just the high level overview of using John's uh, 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 analogy, I'll keep it to the canopy of the trees and not go down to the ground level. Thank oh, you very much. Give it back Floyd. to you, Cecile. Thank you very much, Floyd, for this overview. We will have the chance, hopefully, to go into the, the ground level now. But before we do that, I would like to give the floor to our two other experts. Um, now going to Sandrine DeVos. So Sandrine is Secretary General of Eurofuel. Uh, Eurofuel is the European Heating Oil Association. And uh, Eurofuel represents organizations that promote the use of heating oil and liquid fuels in general for domestic heating in Europe. Welcome, Sandrine, and thank you for being with us. Um, in order to, um, to give you the opportunity to, to maybe state some opening remarks, um, I would like to ask if you could uh, focus those on what is the approach taken in the EU to really incentivize uh, the uptake of low carbon fuels. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you, Cecile, for the nice introduction. Um, I would say the EU uh, has a, a strong contribution to the promotion of the low carbon uh, liquid fuels when it comes to research and development. There are a lot of programs ongoing and, and funding dedicated to the uptake of these liquid fuels. And that's probably one uh, uh, of, the, of the pride of the, of the Commission. Now, when it comes to more um, policy-driven approaches, I must say that they are usually focusing on what uh, the EU sees as the hard to abate sectors. Uh, that's mainly uh, maritime aviation. Uh, we feel that this should be extended to other sectors as well. Uh, and maybe taxation and the upcoming revision of the Energy Taxation Directive will be an opportunity for, for that. Uh, as well, worth mentioning, the EU is considering launching maybe uh, a strategy for low carbon liquid fuels that has been done a, a few months ago for hydrogen. And that would be certainly a, a welcoming sign for investors uh, in, that, in that sector. Now, if uh, I go back to taxation, we see this um, as an opportunity to boost low carbon liquid fuels. Uh, it depends very much, of course, of the design of the taxation, and we could spend hours uh, talking about designing taxation. Um, but basically, if you put a carbon uh, tax component into it, you give a chance to low carbon liquid fuels to have a, a, a better future. Uh, right now, the taxation is volume based, so it's not uh, uh, putting a uh, uh, a favorable light on any specific product. And maybe I will stop here for now and wait for further questions. Very good. Thank you, uh, Sandrine. And obviously, we will come uh, to that later because here we've, with the first two experts, we've seen a little bit a credit system on the one hand, and uh, Sandrine shared some views on taxation, which are two ways uh, that could uh, be used uh, from a regulatory perspective, obviously, to incentivize renewable uh, liquid fuels in the heating sector. But before we dig uh, a little bit deeper into that, I would like to give the floor to our, to our third, sorry, and last expert in this panel uh, this afternoon, uh, who is uh, Christian Halper. Welcome, uh, Christian. Uh, Christian has been working since 2004 for the German Institute for Heat and Mobility as a project engineer and project manager. Thank you uh, very much, Christian, for being here. Um, I wanted to, um, to maybe uh, uh, ask you about one initiative that you are involved in in Germany, which is the Green Fuel Ready Label. And I wanted to understand a little bit from you what it is and uh, where does it fit into this broader discussion about uh, incentives for renewable fuels? 
Thank you very much, uh, Cecile. Good morning and uh, good afternoon to all of you. Um, thanks for inviting me to, the, to this uh, session. And yeah, what, what is a green fuel ready label? Um, well, let, let's look at our, the situation in Germany. Um, we have a little bit more than 5 million oil boilers in Germany and 60% of this 5 million oil boilers, so approximately 3 million boilers, are older than 20 years. And if you look at the homeowners who, who own such an old oil boiler, um, of course, when they are looking for a new heating system, um, they want to make sure that their new heating system that they will be able to use the new system for the next 20 or 25 years because that's a typical um, uh, uh, amount of time people use their heating system in Germany. And uh, last week our Ministry of the Environment published a draft of a new climate protection law. And according to this uh, new uh, draft, Germany must be cl climate neutral in uh, 2045. So um, uh, when, when you count, uh, when you uh, buy a new boiler today and, and you want to use it for 20 or 25 years, then of course this boiler must be able to, to be run with um, um, greenhouse gas neutral fuels in uh, 2045 because it's still running uh, then and uh, so for people um, uh, um, uh, who wants to buy a new heating system it's really important to find a boiler who is able to use uh, today's typical fossil fuel uh, which is able to to use uh, tomorrow's uh, greenhouse gas reduced fuel and which is also able to to use the uh, greenhouse gas neutral fuel which we possibly have in 2045 so and um, the label we are working on right now together with the uh, uh, heating manufacturers is designed to do just that Thank you very much, uh, Christian. And we will go back into um, go back to uh, um, a discussion regarding consumers uh, and um, and the way they should get involved in that energy transition. But before we do that, I would like to go back to to, to Floyd. Floyd, you work for the National Biodiesel Board, uh, so I would like to, I would be interested to to hear from you how effective uh, has been the um, the uh, standards in Oregon and, and, and California in boosting uh, the production and the deployment of renewable fuels such as biodiesel, for example? Uh, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, you know, I, I alluded to the success of the low carbon fuel standard in California and Oregon. So Oregon's program has been in place since uh, 2016, so it is still ramping up, but it is uh, seeing uh, similar success to California. Um, looking at uh, biodiesel and renewable diesel in California, um, just to give you an example of the sort of the, the strength of the market signal this type of program uh, puts out there, uh, biodiesel and renewable diesel grew from a mere 14 million gallons in 2011 at the start of the program to 830 million gallons in 2019. Uh, it's on track, those two fuels are on track to reach a billion gallons um, this year. Uh, and they have grown to the point where they comprise nearly a quarter of each gallon of diesel fuel, 22% of each gallon of diesel fuel uh, consumed in California on average. Um, they generate the lion's share of the carbon reductions uh, under the LCFS. The, the low carbon fuel standard would not exist as it, as it is without these two fuels. Uh, and of course, these two fuels help to decarbonize um, one of the most uh, difficult to decarbonize uh, sectors, which is the heavy duty uh, sector out there. And it could do the same thing with the heating uh, oil sector as well, because that's very difficult to uh, decarbonize, as you know. Um, these two fuels uh, uh, get generate about half of the carbon reductions in the program. Uh, 6.7 million uh, credits that were generated by biodiesel and renewable diesel in 2019. Um, uh, at the current uh, uh, credit prices, they have a current valuation of about $1.3 billion US. 
So you, you can get a sense of the very strong market signal that this type of program provides, but it's not just succeeding just for uh, biodiesel and renewable diesel. You see a similar growth uh, trajectory for uh, other alternative fuels, including renewable natural gas and electricity. Uh, their share of the carbon reductions uh, grew, from, grew to 11% and 19% respectively uh, in 2020. So it's really putting a strong signal to innovate and invest in alternative fuels. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Floyd. And uh, if I may ask a follow-up uh, uh, questions, alongside the standards, um, are there in California or Oregon or any other states some um, uh, additional me measures regarding, uh, for example, energy performance of heating systems or uh, our uh, carbon taxation? Um, or is it really this market-based instrument that is a standard that really uh, 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 leads the effort? Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, unfortunately, uh, you know, the U.S. for uh, all of its progressiveness in California, for all of its progressiveness, um, uh, carbon tax, uh, it gets discussed a lot and it gets dis discussed a lot every uh, legislative session. Uh, it has not found a foothold in this country or in any of the states. Um, I mean, the, the long and short of it is it's a pol politically challenging uh, uh, policy to implement and adopt. And so um, in California, it was considered uh, briefly, but um, uh, rejected for a number of reasons, but primarily because it was not viable from a political standpoint. So uh, in the country, in California and other states, you have a mix of uh, market-based pricing mechanisms like the low carbon fuel standard. We also have a cap and trade program in California, which is applied uh, on an economy-wide basis. Um, you have other states that don't use that sort of market pricing, but they have uh, blending requirements uh, as well as uh, consumption and production incentives. So those all work very well to increase production of uh, uh, alternative biofuels and other alternative fuels. Um, and they, they uh, work very well together. So for example, in California, the low carbon fuel standard uh, credits uh, can be stacked on top of the uh, renewable, uh, the, the RIN credits under the uh, federal RFS program. And so you get a virtual doubling of the, um, the, the price signal uh, to producers and uh, feedstock producers of, uh, of uh, low carbon alternative fuels. So that, that's the sort of example of, you know, it's not one or the other. It, you can have a blend of different types of, of mechanisms to, to get the uh, desired outcome. All right, now turning to Europe, Sandrine, please. Um, a fairly similar question, but uh, in Europe, we already have a uh, energy tax, uh, but there are talks about carbon taxes or an emission trading system, also for heating, and we have also energy performance um, uh, in place. So how do you see, in a nutshell, the pro and the cons of each system, and do you see synergies, as Floyd just mentioned, between them? Well, the, the first thing is that when talking about taxation, it's not a magical recipe. So it should always be used in conjunction with other uh, policy tools. Um, now, the, I mentioned that uh, a carbon component in the tax might boost low carbon liquid fuels. But the downside is that uh, the cost is borne by uh, the consumers because it's a regressive tax. So uh, by making fossil fuels more expensive, it's the lower income which uh, suffer the most. So the, the best way to make this socially acceptable is first to have a tax which is progressive. Um, and then as well, you know, when, when you, you, you put a tax in place, the objective is to have a, a price signal, but as well to generate revenues. So maybe the revenues generated could be put to use for these citizens. What we advocate for is that right now, under the current framework, there is a, a tax reduction for heating because it's a, it's a basic necessity for people. So we would like to keep this to ensure that European citizens can, can keep their houses warm. We already have a, uh, about 7% of, of Europeans who cannot heat their homes properly. So this would be very important. 
coming back to, to the other uh, issues, um, for the emission trading system, there are a lot of debates right now about extending that to buildings. Uh, there, there are a lot of pros and cons. Um, it might be very destabilizing for the existing system to do that. And as well, in the same time, to put uh, taxation, new measures, and buildings in the, in the emission trading, trading system, that might be a lot and might jeopardize the consistency of the, of the whole system. So I, I would not recommend it. Um, but it, it might happen. If it does, let's hope it's going to be a separate system from the existing one. Okay, we shall see. And uh, Sandrine, you mentioned the consumers. Definitely, it's a very important element to take into account. Uh, Christian, based on your experience with the green fuel ready label, what is really the reception of that from the consumers? Do you think they're ready for green fuel? And how would you propose to maybe uh, um, uh, address the distributional impact that Sandrine just mentioned on the most vulnerable uh, households yeah um, um, it, when we talk about greenhouse gas reduced fuels um, there's often or there's always a question uh, why should people use them and um, right now they, they are more expensive than the fossil fuels so um, we we we, we uh, there uh, has to be a driver to to switch to the new fuel and um, yeah when when I look to the German um, situation um, there are only two possibilities to to make it attractive for the people to to do this uh, switch uh, the, the one possibility is to um, yeah to get to, to give them uh, a, um, kind of subsidies for for taking the new fuel or the other um, uh, possibility possibility is to yeah to, to to make it mandatory to use renewable fuels and um, we have uh, 16 states in Germany and um, uh, we have already two of them who, who have such uh, mandatory uh, regulations for example in the south of Germany in Baden-Württemberg since 2010 um, when people renew their heating system they are forced to use uh, a minimum of 15 percent of renewable um, energy and if you um, uh, decide for a new oil boiler then um, you, you are able to fulfill this um, uh, mandatory use by using a, a biofuel. And um, starting from the 1st of July in this year, um, Hamburg um, will, will have the same uh, regulation. And yeah, I think th that things like this could be the, um, the reason why people switch. Very, very interesting. So to look at the fuel rather than looking at the appliance is, uh, is um, yeah, is the strategy that was chosen in that case. To yeah, in, but, but in the end, I, I think um, you, you always um, have to look at the um, complete system. So it's not only the fuel, because the targets we want to reach, they are so ambitious that it's not, um, uh, it wouldn't work if we only switch the fuel. So you, you also have to um, uh, increase the insulation level of your building. So, so you have to decrease the energy demand of the building. You have to use efficient technology. You have to include solar thermal systems or uh, solar electric systems and uh, the um, yeah the energy demand which is still there then it's um, in interesting to look for green fuels all right very good well um i can uh, see there are a lot of comments from the audience but no particular question so in that case uh, although we could speak about this uh, issue for uh, for hours, I think uh, we'll have to uh, wrap up here. But uh, thank you very much, uh, Floyd, Christian, and Sandrine for being with us and providing your insight. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Cecile, that was an excellent panel, and I agree with you. It could have gone on for an hour and been still compelling and interesting. So thank you very much for doing that. Um, we have scheduled a 10 minute break now, so we will reconvene promptly at 10 40, and John. 
Cooper with Fuels Europe will be our first presenter after break. Thank you very much. Let's draw a future-proof heating. Heating with liquid fuels is the preferred option for around 20 million households in the EU. These houses are often not connected to the gas grid and have a limited electricity network. In this case, the heating fuel provides a reliable and sustainable off-grid energy supply. Innovation and sustainability are the core features of our industry. That's why we want to develop heating solutions contributing to the EU's 2050 decarbonization ambitions. But how? Well, we have a clear and gradual approach based on three steps. First of all, improved building insulation and modern condensing boilers are much more energy efficient. Condensing boilers can have an efficiency of almost 98%. Secondly, they can be simply coupled to renewable energy sources such as solar panels. And thirdly, thanks to the industry's continued research and innovation efforts, some eco-friendly new low-carbon liquid fuels are already available in a few countries in the EU. But what are low-carbon liquid fuels? There are many of them. They can be obtained through FAME, fatty acid methyl ester, by processing used cooking oil or from HVO, hydro-treated vegetable oil. They can also be synthetic products achieved through innovative technologies such as power to liquid, where green electricity is synthesized into a liquid hydrocarbon. Beyond providing a huge contribution to reduce emissions, another great benefit is that low-carbon liquid fuels can be used in modern condensing boilers without the need for alterations. While many of our low-carbon liquid fuels are already available in lower scales, it is necessary to scale up their production. So we ask EU and national lawmakers to facilitate investments in new low-carbon liquid fuels for heating, to adopt a technology-neutral approach to decarbonizing heating, to recognize the greenhouse gas reduction potential of low-carbon liquid fuels in the revamp of the EU regulatory framework for renewable energies. If you would like to know more about it, please find all information on our website, www.eurofuel.eu. Let's draw a... Let's... Let's draw a future-proof heating. Heating with liquid fuels is the preferred option for around 20 million households in the EU. These houses are... Der Klimawandel ist eine globale Herausforderung. Um die Treibhausgasemissionen langfristig deutlich zu senken, hat die EU mit dem Green Deal eine Art Fahrplan in eine grünere Zukunft entwickelt. Ziel ist, die Emissionen bis zum Jahr 2050 zu stoppen, auch im Wärmesektor. In ölbeheizten Gebäuden kann der Energiebedarf mit guter Dämmung und modernen Ölbrennwertheizungen gesenkt werden. Mit der Einbindung von erneuerbaren Energien wie Solarenergie wird weiterer Brennstoff und damit auch CO2 eingespart. Den übrigen Brennstoffbedarf können zukünftig erneuerbare flüssige Energieträger abdecken. Diese Future Fuels werden dem heutigen Heizöl zunächst beigemischt. Bis zum Jahr 2050 soll der grüne Anteil schrittweise erhöht werden und schließlich das fossile Heizöl ganz ersetzen. Um den Einsatz der neuen Brennstoffe unter Alltagsbedingungen zu prüfen, haben der Europäische Heizölverband Eurofuel und der Europäische Verband der Heizgeräteindustrie EHI einen zweijährigen Feldtest gestartet. In rund 120 Gebäuden in ganz Europa werden die neuen Fuels jetzt getestet. In Deutschland beteiligt sich das Institut für Wärme und Mobilität mit verschiedenen Häusern an dem Feldtest. 
Europaweit kommen zwei verschiedene Produkte zum Einsatz. Veresterte Bioöle, auch Biodiesel oder Farme genannt, und hydrierte Produkte aus Abfall und Reststoffen. Bei der Auswahl der Brennstoffmischungen wurden die jeweiligen landesspezifischen Besonderheiten berücksichtigt. In England ist Kerosin die fossile Komponente, in Frankreich ist Biodiesel der erneuerbare Anteil und in Österreich wird ein reines, hydriertes Produkt auf Reststoffbasis verwendet. In Deutschland haben 21 Hausbesitzer eine Mischung aus Heizöl, Biodiesel und einer hydrierten Reststoffkomponente bekommen. Allein durch den Wechsel zu diesem Brennstoffmix reduzieren die Haushalte ihre CO2-Emissionen um mindestens 25 Prozent. Schauen wir mal genauer hin. In Schleswig-Holstein liegt der friedrich wilhelm lübcke kog Hier wohnt hans detlef Feddersen auf einem abgelegenen Hof. Umwelt- und Klimaschutz sind ihm wichtig. Seine Ölheizung hat er 2018 modernisiert und betreibt sie nun mit der neuen, treibhausgasreduzierten Brennstoffmischung, die übrigens wie alle anderen im Feldtest eingesetzten Produkte den geltenden Nachhaltigkeitsanforderungen entspricht. Weiter geht es nach Hessen. Hier in Wolfhagen steht das Haus der Familie Rauwolf. Auch sie haben das klimafreundliche Heizöl im Tank. Seit der Modernisierung nutzen sie ein effizientes Ölbrennwertgerät, das mit einer Wärmepumpe kombiniert ist. Die Hybridheizungssteuerung ist besonders innovativ. In der Gemeinde wird der lokal erzeugte Grünstrom genutzt und mit variablen Strompreisen an die Haushalte abgegeben. Steigt die Produktion von Wind- und Solarstrom, sinkt der Preis. Dank der intelligenten Hybridheizung wird der Grünstrom in solchen Zeiten dann auch zum Heizen genutzt. Im rheinland-pfälzischen Baumholder wohnt Anke Georgiades im über 60 Jahre alten Haus ihrer Großeltern. Das Gebäude wurde modernisiert und eine effiziente Ölbrennwertheizung eingebaut. Mit dem Einsatz des grünen Brennstoffs sind die CO2-Emissionen jetzt insgesamt um fast 90 Prozent gesunken. So erfüllt das Haus von gestern bereits heute die Klimaziele von morgen. Das sind nur drei Beispiele des Feldtests, aber auch alle anderen teilnehmenden Haushalte melden durchweg positive Ergebnisse. Alle Anlagen laufen gewohnt zuverlässig und sind der Beweis dafür, dass die Zukunft schon angefangen hat. So just as we start getting ready again, um, the slides we will be making available, Don will circulate a link to this, Don Farrell, who's in the background, making sure everything runs well. We'll circulate a link to everyone that has accessibility to the PowerPoints. Um, we did get permissions from everybody to circulate those this year. Um, and just as an FYI, there's been 113 people in attendance this morning, so a, a fairly robust group of people. So without further ado, let me introduce John Cooper with Fuels Europe, who will give us a, a view of the multiple, multiple uses of biofuels and renewable fuels. Thank you, John. John, you appear to be muted. That should be better. Good afternoon, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me well okay? Yeah. All's good. 
Good, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity today to, to share the work of, of Fuels Europe and um, contribute. And I've been listening to the conversation uh, for, for some time. This last session, very informative, a lot that we can agree with. Uh, so a uh, really good conference. So if I can bring up my slides, I've got a few slides to share with you today to share the work and, and something about Fuels Europe. So if I can bring those up. So uh, we've done a lot of work on low carbon liquid fuels and we've also been designing a strategy for Europe to have these contribute to climate neutrality. And as of, you probably picked up by now, the, um, the big framework of policy and regulation is a bit of a maze to get through in Europe. And I'll give you some tasters for that. Uh, but uh, a deep dive is really not possible in the time available. The next slide, please, just very briefly, just in terms of who is Fuels Europe. Fuels Europe is an association representing the fuels refining sector in Europe. And we have 40 members, and that's actually every single fuels refiner. And that includes many of the major names that are uh, present and uh, producing and marketing in the US as well as in Europe. The next slide, please. Just something briefly about the European Green Deal. I think actually the language may well have been inspired by the ideas of a Green Deal in the US a couple of years ago, but uh, this has now got a significant structure around it and recently it has been announced as an overarching package of policies to deliver a very ambitious vision for Europe including meeting economy-wide, society-wide climate neutrality by 2050. The aim is also for zero pollution of air and water, a circular economy and zero waste, but also quite clearly stated, clean, reliable and affordable energy. And I won't go into the diagram on the right-hand side, but you'll see there's many other elements as well around this. And we are expecting in July a package of 15 regulatory proposals to land to cover all these different things and many more. And then there will be a long process of uh, scrutiny and uh, change and adoption before these become law, expected around 2023. Now, the next slide, please. The work that they have done on this has been inspired by previous modeling work that was also published by the Commission back in 2018. It was called the Clean Planet for All. And this is a graph of the carbon budget that is planned for this whole strategy. And all of the policies are designed to deliver this. And I will highlight their transport in the olive green. It goes down to net zero in 2050. And actually net zero in this case is pretty much absolute zero as well in terms of fossil emissions from transport. But also you'll see residential um, and industry similar. It's uh, really only agriculture, non-CO2 agriculture emissions that are still allowed in 2050, and they have to be offset with other carbon uh, re removal technologies. So my next slide, please. We have devised a whole strategy over the last three to four years, which we call Clean Fuels for All, responding to this title from the Commission. And we've outlined a pathway that can meet climate neutrality by 2050 for all of the remaining liquid fuels demand. And we've said here for road, maritime, air and transport. And actually, we, we can say recognizing the need for, for heat in, uh, in many of the residences and, and buildings across Europe as well that uh, are not on the gas grid and you know, have got difficult electricity supplies. We've priced it and we've described it in terms of the emissions and, uh, and also the, the, uh, well, the technologies as well. And we can show that 100 million tons of reduction of GHG emissions is possible in 2035. And we say that this is complementary to what is expected with electrification. And it's the equivalent of getting an extra 50 million battery vehicles on the road. And we have a request for a policy framework that will make this work as well. I will not go into great detail here. Let's go to the next slide. What do we mean by low carbon liquid fuels? Well, it sounds like I think you've already been talking about many of the options. We are simply saying every single technology, every single feedstock that can be converted to hydrocarbon liquid fuels should be part of this strategy. And that has indeed been included by us. And we've studied the availability of these feedstocks, and that has been a, been a key guide to what is possible here. But we are simply saying all kinds of agricultural and forestry wastes 
but also potentially industrial wastes as well, with a range of different production processes, as well as the first generation biofuels that are recognized as sustainable as well. So it's a combination of first generation advanced biofuels, e-fuels, potentially with CCS in the manufacturing process and also use of, of clean hydrogen for the manufacturing as well. Next slide, please. So this slide here is a summary of hundreds of pages of work to show how this is built up. And on the left hand side here, you'll see the plan for scaling up about five of the technologies, first generation biofuels, only a gentle ramp up, but a significant uh, ramp up of hydrogenated vegetable oil technologies, um, which will be known as renewable diesel in the, in the US. And then cellulosic technologies for using other forms of uh, agricultural waste, e-fuels, um, and uh, uh, manufacturing technologies as well. On the right-hand side, this is an investment profile. And you'll see that actually, as we go to the later years, the big volume boosts come from the advanced biofuels technologies and the e-fuels. E but it uh, gets us to an overall production of 150 million tons of oil equivalent fuels by 2050. Now, that isn't fully replacing petroleum, but it doesn't need to, because we know that in the transport sector, electrification, efficiency, and also some hydrogen will do a lot of substitution for oil. But actually, this meets the needs for entirely the remaining liquids demand, would mean, mean a major contribution to decarbonizing aviation maritime, some road transport, and yes, there is some available for, um, for heat as well. So in the short time we've got, I'm just going to go to my last slide and give you some conclusions. And please recognize that our conclusions have been mostly directed at the transport policy debate here. Europe's climate policy ambition expects only a very small role for petroleum fuels in 2050, a tiny fraction of where it is today, and most of that would be in aviation. But we can see it's very difficult to replace all liquid fuels with electricity or hydrogen fuels the sheer expense of uh, the infrastructure, and also the compromises in utility uh, are very significant. Liquids remain simply the best form of energy storage and delivery for transport and for many other uses as well. And we have shown comprehensively that using a range of technologies and biomass, waste and residue feedstocks, captured carbon, renewable electricity and clean hydrogen we can make a very significant quantity of low carbon liquid fuels. So all remaining liquids in 2050 can be climate neutral. Road transport may eventually be mostly electrified, but recognizing and rewarding renewable fuels has got a real value in the transition in helping the scale up of these technologies, covering the additional costs of the investment and also strategically building capacity. And heating actually could play a similar role. Production costs are expected to be higher than for petroleum fuels, but this is counterbalanced by the ability to use existing storage and distribution infrastructure and a very high practicality for users. The strategy has got very important links as well, helping to scale up uh, low carbon manufacturing techniques. And in the context of Europe's strong climate and taxation policies, we, we can show this is an ambitious strategy for the fuels refining industry but it's very much within reach from a technical, commercial, and political aspect. And we're, as you can imagine, right now in dialogue with many parts of the European Commission and the European Parliament and Council as to how we can bring this forward. Thank you. Happy to take questions. Thank you very much, John. That was excellent. I think that understanding the role of liquids as an alternative delivery system is really key to our futures and industry of suppliers of liquid products. So thank you very much for that. Um, our next speaker is going to be Joe Uglietto, who is a working in the heating oil industry. And I'll say, extending my analogy of going from the forest canopy, this really starts as getting into the forest floor as we look at some actual steps that are being implemented in a number of the states in the United States to lower the carbon intensity of the heating fuel sector. So Joe, if you could get started now, and thank you very much. Great, can you hear me, John? Yes. Perfect. All right. Let's see here. Great.
right. So looking at the uh, options to decarbonize the heating sector uh, in the Northeast United States, uh, which is similar to some parts of Europe, I just a quick background on what I do. I uh, am president of diversified energy specialists. I work in the Massachusetts APS program, which is a portfolio standard that incentivizes thermal technologies here in Massachusetts. Um, and also uh, I work with carbon offsets and renewable energy consulting. So let's start. So looking at the Northeast um, and market trends of kind of the uh, thermal sector, uh, natural gas is the largest player here in the Northeast. Heating oil, uh, electricity, and propane are, are the following three. Looking at uh, the trends from 2010 to 2018, you can see natural gas, electricity, and propane all gaining market share, while heating oil has lost market share and gallons uh, over that period of time. Um, due to electrification policy and transition away from high carbon fuels, I the heating oil industry has certainly uh, been moving in the wrong direction, but over the past couple of years and, and hopefully going forward with implementation, implementation of biodiesel blends and renewable uh, liquid heating fuels, the hope is that we can take back some market share and start moving in the right direction. So looking at the options to decarbonize uh, residential heating sector, um, Heating oil obviously has the opportunity to blend with biodiesel. Uh, Soy-based biodiesel will reduce uh, carbon emissions by 66 to 70 percent. I use cooking oil all the way down to about 82 percent. Natural gas, this is a small amount of renewable natural gas out there, but to uh, get it to the scale it would need to make a real difference, at least here in the east, northeastern part of the United States, would be very difficult. Electricity, air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps, of course, have the ability to reduce the carbon intensity over time with the renewable electricity generation. Um, and propane uh, doesn't currently have the ability to reduce their carbon score at scale. So looking at electricity here, uh, of course, in Europe and in many different countries, the electricity mix is very different. Uh, in ISO New England, uh, for the New England states, natural gas is, is the largest. Uh, uh, electricity generator. Uh, renewables have certainly grown in the past few years and certainly if you look at the 2020 chart, uh, renewables have gained significant market share. Looking at PJM, kind of the mid-Atlantic, um, there's a lot more coal used in the middle of the country here in the United States than specifically the Northeast or uh, West Coast. And I think the problem is that when air source heat pumps are running in the winter, the electricity is the most expensive and the dirtiest that it typically uh, is for the, the course of the year. So I think that's where biofuels take a, a bigger role and provide advantages. So looking at uh, the installation of air source heat pumps, given that policy here in the Northeastern United States has been pushing for electrify everything uh, in the building sector, um, I think it's really important to understand what it would cost to electrify everything first before potentially considering the greenhouse gas reductions from electrifying everything. And so I did a, a study in, in Massachusetts. There was a, a heat pump program, incentive program that was in place from 2014 to 2019. Um, there's over 22,000 applications from residents in Massachusetts who installed air source heat pump systems uh, to some degree. Of those 22,000 and change applications, uh, I've established that about 622 of those could be whole home uh, solutions, uh, given the size and BTUs of the system versus the square footage of the home. Uh, putting them kind of on a graph based on self-reported square footage of conditioned space versus the total cost to the homeowner to uh, install the system, you can see that the average cost for a median sized residence in Massachusetts, which is roughly 1,900 square feet, cost a little north of $21,000. Um, it's very expensive. And I think that um, despite the policy push, there isn't enough incentive to truly believe that we'd be able to equi 
equitably across as a state or a country or you know a number of countries like Europe reduce greenhouse gas emissions and you know, be able to afford it. Uh, so I think the, the conversion cost is a huge barrier to entry when it comes to air source heat pumps. Uh, looking at the same study in Massachusetts, of those 622 homes that, that converted to heat pump systems, 92% uh, self-reported they're still using a supplementary form of heat, whether it be um, uh, the heating oil system they already had in place, the natural gas system, uh, electric resistance heat as a backup. Um, almost all installers here, at least in, in the Northeast uh, United States, that are putting air source heat pump systems in don't recommend removing uh, their legacy system, whether it be natural gas or heating oil. Uh, typically in new build construction, there is the opportunity to put it in a whole home solution, but uh, given the weather and the operability issues of heat pumps in very cold weather here, uh, typically you're going to see a backup heat source. Here's an example of just one specific home that I dealt with and registered for rebates here in Massachusetts. It cost them about 23000 to convert a 1900 square foot home. Uh, they use their air source heat pump system that they put in for about 95% of the annual heat load. 5% they use their legacy system, heating oil, uh, to heat their homes. That's about there. So looking at air source heat pump programs uh, here in the Northeast and the incentive to install uh, cold climate air source heat pumps, uh, most of the programs we've seen uh, incent incentivize at the residential level. Um, there's been a a ton of investment from utilities, uh, cities, and state governments, and even the federal government in these programs. In 2020, we saw uh, more than 100 million additional dollars invested compared to 2019 to show 70% you know, plus growth in, in program funding. Um, you know, the, the incentives range really upstream versus downstream, whether it's going to be residential or on the installer base. Some are both installer and uh, system owner, so homeowner based. Uh, some are retrofit, some are new build construction. Uh, looking at a Massachusetts example, so you know, if you were putting a air source heat pump system in Massachusetts, you'd be eligible to receive an incentive from the Massachusetts Alternative Portfolio Standard, which would be energy credits that you generate and be able to sell those vary significantly. So it's tough to really put a, a dollar value on what those would be worth. You'd also receive a mass save incentive, which would be up to $1,600 per ton of a non-ducted air source heat pump or up to $1,000 per ton of a ducted um, mixed air source heat pump system. Mass EEC would give the average rebate they give for uh, heat pump systems that qualify for the APS would be just over $2,500, which is pretty significant. So you can see the kind of uh, capital being put into the Electrify Everything movement. Uh, in New York, I, I just am finishing up a study there similar to the one in Massachusetts of a uh, air source heat pump uh, rebate program. And it was about seventeen dollars to $18,000 on average per air source heat pump installed. Uh, only about 322 air source heat pumps in, in a three year period were considered whole home by NYSERDA. Uh, so the question really becomes, are these conversions uh, working to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? And secondly, are they being adopted at wide scale? And even with significant capital being put into um, incentivizing these, uh, these conversions, it doesn't seem that they're taking on at this speed and level of uh, widespread adoption that is hoped. Um, also, one of the trends we've seen um, uh, to, to the forefront is a lot of people are putting in these air source heat pump systems, using them, uh, receiving the rebate, using them in the summer for uh, cooling and less so in the winter for heating, uh, given the cost. I think that, that wraps me up there, John. Thank you very much, Joe. It's very interesting to see, as I said, as we go into the forest floor, the real details on what this means for consumers, 
cost of society. It's, you know, I'll say at the beginning, it's big lines on graphs showing carbon reductions and, you know, ambitious goals. But then when you start getting into the real detail in the weeds, it becomes much more difficult to understand. And I think that's, you know, kind of leads us into Maureen Cornelis's next, um, the next presentation. She's an ambassador to the EU. And from what I understand from Sandrine has some very interesting takes on what this will mean to um, different people in the economic strata and how that will affect them directly and how important it is to factor those into any policy goals. So thank you very much, Maureen. Thank you, John, for this uh, very nice introduction. Indeed, I'm Marin Cornelis. I run a consultancy called Nexenji Consumer. And recently I was appointed as one of the ambassadors of the European Climate Pact, which is, uh, let's say, a pact uh, between um, uh, the uh, European civil society and the European Union to promote a sustainable future. Uh, and I will be talking about consumers at the center of heating policies because, uh, pun intended, I've seen that the debate over uh, the role of the consumer is really hot right now in the conversation in the chat. So um, I, I'm really happy that I can maybe provide some insights for you. And if you have any questions, uh, please reach out to me. I'm, I'm on all social media. Uh, next, please. Uh, so at the moment, I put some, some data from 2016, but the data have stayed roughly the same in Europe. So we have the residential sector, which accounts for about a fourth of the final energy consumption with space heating being the main uh, part and water heating as well. So we can imagine that we have we have about 80% of the energy consumption that that is uh, uh, that is really to to heat water or space so it's it's still quite uh, quite huge and in most cases uh, the, uh, the the this heating comes from gas and from electricity uh, other res let's say sources of of um, energy are um, are uses um, i mean other sources are also used for cooking and lighting and appliances, but roughly uh, we can say that on average, uh, about 6% uh, of the European household budget is devoted to energy, which is, uh, if you think about it, it's quite, uh, quite a lot. Um, move on, please. Yeah. And especially because we have, we still have in Europe an enormous problem of energy poverty. It's energy poverty. Uh, it's also known in the US as energy vulnerability or um, energy scarcity. Um, it's uh, it's it's caused by really high costs uh, of energy, uh, poor energy efficiency, and also low incomes. But there are also many other structural factors uh, that are in place, uh, from the job markets, the way it's structure to, uh, to the time spent at home, etc. And overall in Europe, we have about 30 million people affected by energy poverty with 30.3 uh, million which are unable to keep up with their utility bills and 34 who are unable to heat their home properly in the winter. And you know, what's interesting is that a, uh, at EU level, we are still not collecting data on um, cooling our home, although uh, we all know that um, the uh, heat waves will be way more lethal in the coming year if we don't do anything about that. And uh, and some houses, some dwellings are not really adapted to our uh, setup for, uh, for uh, uh, heat waves. Another parameter that is extremely important uh, to keep in mind is that uh, in Europe, our building stock is deteriorating really, really fast. Um, about three fourths of the EU building stock is completely energy inefficient, meaning that uh, you are basically heating the stars when you are heating your your place, and that needs to uh, to 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 we need to do something in order to you know to solve uh, the 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 climate crisis um, as well. And on average, uh, we are at less than 1% of the national building stock, which is renovated at a really high level each year. Because uh, when we talk about renovation, many, many times we talk about superficial renovations, such as, I don't know, changing the, the windows or something like that. And this is not efficient, this is not bold enough to make significant uh, energy savings. And uh, another parameter to take into account is that there are huge discrepancies between the European member states and this um, the, 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 the map that I'm 
the maps that I'm showing now, uh, they were designed pre-COVID, so the situation must have changed quite a lot uh, with the lockdowns and with many people spending time at home and uh, being furloughed, etc. But you can see really a strong, uh, let's say, a north, south, and west, east um, uh, difference between the countries, and still uh, with the with maybe uh, uh, countries like uh, Bulgaria or Greece, which are uh, mostly affected by this issue of, uh, of energy poverty. Next, please. So what is the European Union doing uh, to kind of solve the, save the planet and save the people? The EU is working on let, a just transition uh, with the idea that it will leave no one behind. Um, this just transition is really uh, embedded in the idea that uh, energy efficiency has to come first. It has been a principle since the 2000s, but it's now, uh, you know, the European Union is repeating that uh, quite all the time. And so energy efficiency first, and uh, let's go for a uh, very bold climate ambitions. So in uh, in the past years, uh, there was a clean energy for all package that was adopted. This idea is that it was designed uh, for consumers for to be at the driving seat. So consumers got a new series of future proof rights, such as uh, right on information, information measure, uh, empowerment measures, um, measures on energy communities to bold re demand response, etc. And uh, two years ago, the European Commission presented uh, the ideas, the first ideas for European Green Deal uh, that was already mentioned by previous speakers. And uh, with the idea that uh, Europe should become climate neutral by 2050 and improve the well-being of people. So we have this combination between, um, let's say, social welfare and the planet welfare, the idea that they will go together. And to do that, there is the uh, renovation wave to accelerate the uh, level of performing uh, renovation. Next, please. And so what 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 kind of message I want to 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 keep with those uh, with those uh, policies is that we can wonder if the the objectives are bold enough, because so far what I understand is that uh, solving energy poverty and making sure that um, affordability is really at the center is only, let's say, a side uh, thought from the European uh, Commission. Because for instance, the EU housing stock renovation objectives remain really low, about 3% per, per year. So um, to, to, to get into a net zero, it's, it's really complicated with such a low level um, and it's hard enough to help the people. And then uh, it's not really taking into consideration the cost of increasing building efficiency. Um, so we need more targeted financial support and also tailored advice. And um, another problem that remains is the subsidiarity principle, the idea that member states implement maybe, a, kind, they have some guidelines from the European Commission, but they are, they are quite loose. So uh, you will keep on seeing very uh, strong differences between uh, the countries. And what do we need also? We need social acceptance. We need to understand that the, the house that we are not, that we are living in is no longer fit for, uh, let's say, the old age, or it's not long, no longer fit for people to live in. And that will be maybe one of the objectives of the renovation wave is to have um, a performance certificate for homes that will constrain owners to, to increase the, the, the performance of the housing. So we will see how that is implemented. Um, one thing that is absolutely missing, uh, and it, it will probably make us totally miss the, miss the, the, the point, but it's that um, there is the tendency to see renovation as a one size fits all and heating policies as a one size fits all. But we are still lacking disaggregated data on households, fleet characteristics, uh, such as, I don't know, uh, people moving in and out and and working only two days a week from home and etc also from the location the gender habit etc so uh it's really dangerous to to have this kind of approach that is really too um too um too narrow and uh we also need uh an, uh, an adapted uh, consumer protection framework uh, because uh, there are, for instance, with the energy offers, some flexibility plans that might not be fit. Uh, certain uh, energy providers are still not 
uh, using uh, alternative dispute resolution or a certain form of support to heating policies are still not covered. For instance, in many countries, if you use solid fuel to heat your home, you might not be uh, get the, the social benefits. So this is the kind of thing that needs to be adapted in order to be really fit for purpose and fit for the, the consumer of the future. And I, that is uh, it for me. Uh, I will be happy to answer any of your questions later. Maureen, that's excellent. I think it's very interesting. It's, you know, it's kind of like Joe, when you start getting into the weeds of really looking at consumers' behaviors, individuals and how they occupy a home, it gets very interesting and very complicated. I know we're even in the U.S. trying to, Joe said, how much does it cost for a house to be renovated? Well, every house is different and every occupant is different, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very hard to do. So um, I'm glad you're working on this. <laughs> Thank you. you know, it's really, really interesting to see uh, the different approaches and the different local approaches as well on, on those matters. So the next speaker is um, Wilfred Linke, who will be doing a presentation on the different tests that they're doing in the EU on how fuels will work in our type of equipment. And with that, I'll turn it to you, Wilfred. Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, uh, hello uh, together. Uh, good morning for the United States. Uh, afternoon, good afternoon here for jo uh, Europe. Uh, yes, I will show you some uh, information about the current running uh, field trial, uh, which we have uh, heard uh, some uh, um, presentations before that we are uh, running uh, in Europe. Uh, and uh, how low carbon fuels can be uh, uh, used uh, in the in given uh, installations, please. Uh, that is the content. Uh, first of all, who we are, uh, where we are coming from. Uh, uh, this uh, is a presentation uh, of our our, our German association. Uh, then uh, what are the objective and what is the latest state of play? Uh, uh, yes, please go ahead. So who, who is the BDH? The so BDH is the German uh, Federation of German Heating Industry. We are now about 120 members uh, this year as well. Some uh, new members have been uh, uh, accepted. So we are nearly uh, reaching the 125. Uh, you see uh, we are inside the building and outside the building. Uh, um, uh, we are uh, nearly 90% uh, or rep representing nearly 90% of the heating market uh, in Germany and uh, uh, we have uh, various uh, departments which are looking for all the uh, heating appliances or appliances which are used uh, for heating up or cooling uh, the buildings. Um, thank you. Next please. So what are the uh, uh, claim of our association? This is the uh, uh, Association for Climate Protection and Energy Efficiency. And then I will go only uh, or highlight only the red uh, uh, colored uh, sentences. So um, we have heard today that uh, the climate protection is one of major issue to survive uh, on this uh, uh, earth. So uh, um, we have realized that uh, now at least two thirds of the reduction can also be uh, achieved by modernization of obsolete heating uh, systems. That means old heating systems can be exchanged uh, and uh, that's uh, due to efficiency and used uh, with uh, modern uh, new developed uh, fuels. That means in the gas market also for hydrogen, which is in um, a really big discussion uh, all over Europe. Uh, should it be used for uh, uh, the heating market or not? Uh, we think yes, uh, and as well we are thinking um, that also the uh, um, uh, uh, renewable heating, uh, liquid heating uh, fuels uh, should also be used. Uh, but there are some uh, 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 agencies or some uh, ideas uh, from from uh, governmental side which are not uh, taking this into account. But we are stating uh, clearly that we want to have a technology neutral 
uh, an energy neutral uh, um, future, which will not uh, restrict the one or other uh, technology, but which will give the chance uh, for every uh, consumer uh, having a building or living in a building uh, that he can uh, use individual energy sources. That's from wood, uh, gas, or uh, hydrogen in future, maybe, or electricity, whatever he wants, he can use. Please, the next slide. So this is uh, where you can find us. Uh, you can skip. Uh, next, please. Um, and what are the objectives? So the German situation in 2020 is as such, as you see here in this um, uh, cake diagram, uh, uh, the red ones are the oil, and we are talking now here uh, mainly about oil, uh, but the yellow ones are the uh, gas heated uh, area. You see that nearly 1 million heat pumps are uh, still in, uh, are, are installed up to now, uh, but also uh, these green, uh, part uh, which are the solid fuel boilers um, but the big uh, one big portion uh, one qu quarter nearly that's uh, oil heating uh, you see there are the uh, numbers of uh, uh, condensing boilers are really uh, small up to now this is uh, light uh, red uh, it's are only 100 uh, 1.7, no, sorry, 0 0.7 uh, um, million uh, uh, condensing boilers in, installed in uh, Germany, uh, and the majority is about 4.8 million uh, is nearly uh, uh, the old, uh, uh, old, old stuff, uh, um, and uh, this should be exchanged, in our opinion, very quickly because the time is running and the uh, ideas uh, to to um, restrict uh, oil f liquid fuel uh, um, uh, heating oil uh, burning is is really strong uh, in the discussion and so uh, we should uh, uh, exchange as quick as possible uh, these kind of uh, appliances but um, uh, the new law and please go ahead uh, um, uh, to stop is not a solution uh, i wanted to say yes uh, it's okay next please um, because there are uh, uh, the possibilities here we have heard about uh, the green deal and here's the transformation into the german um, uh, uh, situation uh, this is a really brand new uh, information uh, which because uh, the numbers uh, on the left side uh, uh, are, are changed last week uh, uh, that are not finalized maybe hopefully it is finalized but uh, the federal cabinet has uh, stated that uh, and accepted that but now uh, the german bundestag has to decide about uh, but what I wanted to clearly point out that uh, uh, nearly 70% uh, of the CO2 equivalent reduction can be done by uh, modernization of the uh, heating uh, appliances. Uh, one uh, third is uh, by uh, the um, uh, renovation uh, of, of uh, the heat demand means uh, a, a renovation of the building and reduction of the heat demand. So uh, altogether we can reach the uh, new given uh, uh, numbers for the Green Deal um, and hopefully uh, this will uh, stay uh, so that we can concentrate on how to transform it and not to discuss uh, uh, what are the numbers. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, uh, what is now the latest state of play uh, for our field trial? Uh, um, the status is uh, that uh, we have finalized the fir first heating session. Um, nearly uh, my uh, heating system here, my oil heating system at home is still running because it's overnight it's still cold but hopefully it will uh, get uh, warm soon um so what are the problems next slide please um 
there are no really uh, not really problems uh, uh, analyzed uh, up to now um, please next slide uh, we have only reached uh, some information from the switzerland uh, that with ucom uh, these uh, uh, use cooking oils um, th that there is a, a problem with the nozzles that they uh, are uh, encapsulated or glazific classified uh, that is uh, a problem uh, which uh, causes uh, uh, the, the different um, uh, origin of this UCOM uh, not to saying that uh, uh, McDonald's and, and Kentucky Fried Chicken or uh, three star uh, Michelin uh, uh, cooking um, uh, cook uh, has uh, differences uh, but that is a fact uh, we have to take into account and we can we should solve this uh, maybe by elimination of this uh, problem uh, with an, a special additive we have to look for and in germany one uh, oil pump fails um, the reason behind is not clear up to now it can also be a real quality problem of the uh, oil pump so uh, that are the real uh, 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 results uh, which, which I can tell you uh, for this and next slide please uh, and this is an overview uh, of uh, the European field trial where all and uh, which with which uh, different uh, um, uh, renewable uh, fuels the appliances are running and if you are going left, uh, you see in Sweden uh, or in Finland, we start. Uh, you see that they are all used cooking, uh, uh, hydrogen used cooking oils. Uh, in Sweden, they have uh, also uh, vegetable oils. Uh, in Norway, only fame, uh, and so on. You can see this, uh, you can read that. Um, uh, and in, in total, that are about 164 appliances which are running quite good. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, the, uh, over the summer the, nothing will happen uh, and the next heating period uh, uh, will uh, give us uh, the same results so that we can uh, have the same results as uh, now nearly 12 years ago where we tested uh, in such a manner the same with only fame uh, uh, heating fuels so more i cannot say that's i think that's a good uh, information uh, that nothing happened uh, which uh, causes uh, any problems thank you thank you wilfred it's very important that we share all this type of information uh, the us has done a number of field studies and continues to do a lot of analysis of equipment and mixed fuels and with such a base and such a slow turnover of our fleet so to speak understanding problems how to resolve them is critical to an adoption of a, an aggressive approach towards renewable fuels. Um, so at this point in the agenda, I'm going to do a kind of a overall description of what the heating oil industry in the US is focused on and trying to be competitive for the future. And so Don, if you would bring up my slides. And next slide, please. So I guess obviously from today, and I'll go through this quickly, is global warming is considered a major problem in the heating oil states. Um, the United States is pretty much divided into the southern half and the northern half. Um, unfortunately, you know, the southern half doesn't really believe in global warming and the states are not doing any activity, but where we have market share, pretty much almost all the states are very aggressively looking at how do they reduce emissions. I would say that electrification is seen as the universal answer, um, whether it's for trucks, cars, buildings, which is the most important to us, but you know, getting electricity from renewable sources such as wind turbines or PV is something that really is being focused on. And then I'll say that equipment and fuel changes. I think that, you know, I'll say for our industry, we've been looking at working with 5% biodiesel as a component of heating oil since I believe 2007, and we're just now ramping up to the next generation of equipment, which will be 20% biodiesel. And you know, with the pace of change being described by everybody, it's clear we all have to put the foot on the accelerator or we're gonna be left behind. We need better equipment, we need to be adopting and have it ready for the different fuels. So the next slide, Don. 
So what do we have as an advantage, you know, looking at the challenges? We have a liquid fuel. As we all know, liquid fuels store energy better than any other product. Um, you know, Thomas Edison was working on batteries 100 years ago, and just around the corner was the magical battery. We still do not have that magical battery. Liquid fuels store energy and make it available and store it well, better than anything else. Um, we have a well-researched and readily available biofuel component, that's biodiesel. It works in our heating equipment. Um, we've been working it and been very successful at 20% blends of that equipment. We've been doing research at 50% blends and we have a number of dealers that have been selling it at the 80%, 100% level for a number of years. So it's a workable fuel. Um, and then the final thing is a transition to electricity will be expensive. Okay, Don. Um, so what do we know about electrification? We don't think it's the answer for the thermal sector. Conversions to electricity, as Joe mentioned, are gonna be both ineffective and expensive. Um, you know, a number of the heating oil states are in high, in very high degree days, very cold and very variable climates and heat pumps in those climates are not very successful. Um, converting a whole load of electricity to re renewable um, will be difficult if not impossible. You know, we have states that I think we're about a have as low as a 0.1% share of renewables. So when you talk about how much do those renewable sectors have to grow just to cover the existing load of electricity. And then when you talk about converting a whole load, you're talking about tripling the load in some cases. So there's going to be very difficult to convert everything. And then the obvious thing is matching load in the supply to the electricity sector will create very extraordinary costs and be expensive. And I'll illustrate some of this with some slides. Next slide, Don. This is kind of a difficult slide, but um, just so you understand, it's really trying to assess wind generation and how much electricity does wind do. And the one thing you see is that the wind is very variable. It can be producing up from 37 to, I think we said a thousand megawatts. Um, so when you're trying to match wind to consumption, it becomes extremely difficult. I think when we think about like solar and, you know, the summer, you know, matching electricity demand is fairly easy. You know, the sun's out in the middle of the day. That's the hottest part of the day. Electricity loads highest in between 4 and 6 p.m. So it's very even. Um, wind doesn't not match that. And when you start talking about the thermal load, it's going to be even a harder match. Next slide. Don, next slide, okay. Um, this is just thinking about the peaks. You know, currently the US is a summer peaking. As the Europeans talk, I always think it's a little bit interesting because the air conditioning is not as predominant in Europe as it is here, but as the climate gets hotter and hotter, air conditioning is gonna put a lot of load on them too. But we are a summer peak in most of our electric generation systems. Um, so you basically say that's kind of the baseline of what the electric utilities are producing in the united states the winter peak you know in new england is a little bit lower today but when you start talking about putting heat pumps and this is not in, does not include automobiles and other users um, would add 13 gigawatts of power to that um, so the peak would switch from a summer peaking to a winter peaking and then even with putting in a ton of batteries th three gigawatt of batteries you're still gonna have a tremendous increase in electricity demand. And then obviously PV doesn't you know, produce much in the winter. And you know, if there's snow on it, it doesn't produce anything at all. And wind power can also be infrequent in the winter also. So we have to be aware of those mismatches going on. Next slide, Tom. Um, and this is kind of a, a model that Nora has been working on for about three or four months. And it's really trying to be a multivariable model looking at how does heat pumps whose performance falls during the, you know, as the temperature falls, how does that compare to biodiesel at increasing blend levels? And then how do we look when we think about reducing carbon, we can't think about what we're gonna be reducing in 2050, because if we load carbon between now and 2050, we're gonna have created more problems that we'll ever be able to unwind. So getting carbon out of the atmosphere as quickly as possible is probably as important as getting to net zero in 2050. So trying to understand those and put those in the model is something Nora did. So this model, and I, you know, I draw your attention to the graph in the upper right, is really looking at a 
fairly slow conversion, fairly slow conversion to biodiesel. And the biodiesel conversions are looking at those solid lines, uh, green, orange, and blue, green being the highest and best technology, blue being the standard technology today. Um, and then this has an aggressive move to heat pumps um, in the US. And you know, Joe mentioned, you know, we've converted about 200. This I think would require us to be converting uh, several thousand homes a year. And this is just the state of Massachusetts um, per year and have to be consistently be converting, I'll say about 12,000 homes per year to heat pumps. And I think Joe mentioned in New York, we've converted 200 people to whole house conversions over a period of three to four years. So is that even doable? But even then you see the biodiesel being predominant. Next slide. Now this is how I'll say, uh, if we get our act together and really work towards a bio blend, this is a probably more realistic model. Um, this shows what the biodiesel blends can do to reducing carbon. And obviously the higher the graph is, higher the bar is, the better, because that means carbon reduced. And so with an aggressive move to biodiesel, and I'd say not aggressive that we can't do, aggressive that we can do, um, shows what type of carbon reductions we can accomplish. And then if you look at a more realistic view of what a heat pump conversion does, those are those graph lines that are essentially in laying on top of the x-axis. Um, that's a 1% one, 1 conversion rate per year, which is still um, decimal points higher than what's actually occurring today. So, you know, that's probably still unrealistic. Um, so we have to kind of focus on that. So that there's a big gap between what we can do and are doing versus what the electrics can do. So I think we do have a societal answer and we have to be focused on that. Next slide. So what do we have to do as an industry? Um, the equipment we do has to be bio ready. Um, and by that, I mean, it has to be ready for biodiesel or renewable diesel, and I'll say novel biodiesels, novel biofuels. Moore has been looking at some that are made from cellulosics, where those are pie oils, ethylovulinate, we have to be ready for next generation change. Um, so we need our equipment manufacturers to be anticipating changes, be ready for them and be have the equipment flexible so our fleet can adapt to those things. Um, we really as an industry have to, as I think was mentioned earlier, look at super high efficiency equipment. I'll say in the US, we've been arrested at the 86 to 90% efficiency level, seemingly my whole career. So I think we need to really be thinking about you know, the fuel fired heat pumps. Um, when I mean that liquid fuel fired heat pumps being fired by a biofuel. So we can jump the 100% barrier. I'll say this is something that's a personal sore spot. We have to get electricity from a biofuel that's compatible with our equipment. Um, if we can do that, we solve the energy security issue, which is very important everywhere. Um, I suspect maybe more in the US, but you know, the state of Texas was without power for about a week. Um, Hurricane Sandy in the Northeast shut down virtually millions of homes, and we continue to have those types of energy security problems. Colonial pipeline being shut down by terrorists indicate that if we can be generating electricity at home and firing the home with biofuel, we'll be in the best shape of anybody. So we have to get there. Um, we have to continue to look at new fuels and look at ways to avoid feedstock shortages. Um, you know, we really have to be thinking about not making 4 billion gallons, but making 50, 60 billion gallons of fuel for this industry from renewables. Um, and then I'll say in the short term, we're losing share to heat pumps and natural gas. We have the long-term solution, but if we lose too much share, we won't get the, the investment in our industry that's necessary. We won't get the commitment. And as we know from policy leaders, when you get too small, you're easy to hit. So we have to be work diligently to make sure that we hold as much share as possible for as long as we can, because we will be the solution. We just have to be there when this, when they need the solution. So thank you. And I'll turn it back to Maritz, who will do the European roadmap, and then he will also do a wrap up today. So thank you very much, Maritz. You are muted, Maurice. Sorry. 
Thanks. Uh, so this is the last presentation for today. And I would like to answer two most important questions which we always are asked. It is why liquid fuels and how many or how much. And next slide, please. In the first slide, I would like to ask the first question. Why liquid fuels in future? What are the advantages? I think it's mostly four points. It's reliability, it's the easy transport, the easy storage because of the high energy density. And secondly, it's suitable for all buildings, even buildings, old buildings with high energy demands. Secondly, it's flexibility. You don't need any grids. It can be supplied everywhere. We just talked about rural areas. It can be combined well with renewable energies, with photovoltaic, solar thermal, or biomass. And the boilers are ready to operate with low carbon liquid fuels. Thirdly, it's affordability. Modernization of the heating system requires less or even no modification of the building. And last but not least, it's high efficiency. I think we have a really very high efficient system uh, on the market, condensing boilers up to 98% efficiency. I think we can't reach more. Next slide, please. So this is our vision. This is our vision for the future. Today, as I already said at the beginning, we have 20 million households. Um, Eurofuel wants a technology-oriented solution, which means we accept other energies as well. We very well know that there will be more and more heat pumps, but not for all purpose. We are thinking about greenhouse reduction via high-efficient heating technology. This is the renew renovation of the heating system in the first step. Second step is increase of renewable energy sources in hybrid systems. And the third step that we are talking about today mostly is the introduction of renewable fuels. And the goal is to reach EU targets, which is zero emission at 2050. And what you already heard, in some countries even earlier. Germany, it's 2045, for example. Next slide, please. Our members often ask about a future perspective. How much heating oil will be sold in future? And we can say it's relatively easy. You only need to calculate the amount of boilers and the consumption each boiler. So this sounds easy, but you have to have the figures. For that reason, you need a database. We have a Eurofuel database, which you partly will find on our website. We have the basis of the Interna uh, International Energy Agency. We have Eurostat, and we have the figures of the European heating industry. And we put everything together. Next slide, please and calculated a model with it. As already mentioned, the model follows the EU targets. It's minus 55 up to 2030 and zero up to 2050. And we calculated that the heating oil will be, demand will be reduced via efficiency, insulation, hybrid systems, renewable fuels, and the migration to other energy sources. Um, we also uh, assumed that in 2050, only high efficient condensing systems are on the market. Next slide, please. To calculate this, it is sometimes an unknown future. So we calculated three different scenarios. We have a restrictive scenario. And behind this scenario, you will always find some political ideas. Green fuels are not accepted as a solution to reduce CO2 emissions. We don't have any uh, level playing field for the different energy sources. And we will have bans, restrictions, 
and no subsidies for CO2 reduced domestic heating oil. So this is the worst scenario. Then we have a middle scenario, business as usual, no restrictions, but no benefits. And we have the enabling scenario. The uh, need of the liquid energy sources will be recognized. And if you have in mind that the target is really not easy to achieve, you all need all forces. Maybe politicians will sometimes have that in mind and will accept the green fuels as a solution. Um, it's also needed that there are some incentives or you may call it business cases, to use and to produce the green fuels. Somewhere discussed today, it's energy tax. So, for example, green fuels will be more expensive, that's sure. But if the energy tax will be reduced or, got, or put to, to the zero for a certain time, that will for sure help to put, uh, get these products on the market. Next slide, please. This is our calculation. Most important is the number of sold heating systems in a year. And this is the, uh, um, the light blue line on the top. And the highest figure is 400,000 all over EU. And you see figures up to 2020. That's, these are real figures. And starting from 21, it's our calculation. So maximum is 400,000. The medium is 350 and the lowest 240. In all cases, we assume that it will drop a little and then it will increase because we have several uh, homes which really not have a real chance. They don't have a gas grid, they have a high energy demand, they can't use heat pumps, so they will mostly focus on these systems. So there you will find an increase, a slight or higher increase in all scenarios. Um, in the pink line, you will find the sum of all oil heated appliances. And you will see that these will be reduced roughly from 20 millions to about 10 millions in the highest scenario and in the lowest to 5 millions. So a reduction will be accept. Uh, we have to accept a reduction, but we have still we ensure, we ensure that there are still several uh, in uh, several appliances in 2050. Next slide, please. Here you have the share of the renewable component. And this depends strongly on the production of the component. So we start slightly. We, we decided to start with a 33% share, which makes the CO2 emission equivalent to natural gas. So this product is equivalent in CO2 emission. So there is no advantage for a gas unit. And this will be uh, stable up to 2036. And then it will be increased up to 100% product in 2050. So all boilers will get 100% uh, renewable product in 2050. Next slide, please. And this is the graph where the consumption is showed. And you will find in red the total DHO sold in the years. And this will be reduced drastically, as you see. But for sure, this is some, this is a whole product. And you see in green, the renewable product, this amount will increase. And having in mind that we only have a limited amount of the renewable product, we have to reduce the total amount. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. And at the end, you found out for the best case, 10 million, for the medium case, 7.5 million, and for the lowest case, case 5 million tons, which is approximately 1,200 liters each home. 
And in gray, you will find the according CO2 emission, uh, 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 sh sorry, the according share of the uh, renewable comment component, which will slightly increase in the first years and then goes to 2050 to 100% share. Next slide, please. The summary, we are almost looking uh, uh, of our high of our positive scenario and we call it 10, 10, 0 until 2050. And that means 10 million heating systems, 10 million tons domestic heating oil sold and zero CO2 emission. I think this is quite a nice information if you have to, in uh, have to in mind that you want to decarbonize the sector. Next slide, please. Yes, this was the last slide for today. And I hope I could show you the idea which we are following and to give you some ideas about the future in selling oil heating systems as well as in selling domestic heating oil. And I'm afraid now we are at the end of today's conference. We had roughly two and a half hour. I think it's a little more. We had 13 speakers on the panel. We started with an interesting insight into the political and regional issues in US, EU and UK, um, followed by a discussion about strategies for encouraging and renew renewable fuels. After the break, uh, we had a session which is looking after other sectors using renewable fuels. Um, and I think it's interesting, we also looked at the consumer because we have to have in mind that at the end, he will take the decision. In summary, I would say, the framework conditions are challenging, but we have a suitable solution ready. And now we need a suitable political framework creating a business case for the renewable fuels to make it work. At the end, I would close with a big thank to all speakers. It was only you to make this day working. Another thank goes to the colleagues from NORA, especially John, Tom and Don, for the good and successful cooperation. It was a pleasure for me. And to Sandrine from Eurofuel, who invested lots of time to ensure that everything is running well on the EU side. Please keep in mind that the next Eurofuel NORA conference will take place next Thursday, same time, same location. Hope to see you again. Thank you and goodbye.